thanks for items and remind members that means that you can be heard and you might want to mute your, your devices when you're not speaking. Uh, can I ask members if you are aware of any apologies? Nope. Clark, I have an apology from Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Sure. Um, just from, from myself, I will happen to be away at one o'clock of commission today. So. No problem. Um, we, we'll try and make sure business moves through the evidence sessions as promptly as possible then. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, chairperson's business then. Uh, members, I thought it was worth drawing your attention to uh, the Education Minister announcement uh, by topical questions on Twitter yesterday with regards to his intention to do work on flexible school starting age, um, particularly in relation to premature births. That's, a, that's an issue the committee and committee members have been raising for some time. Um, and I thought it prudent for me to propose that we request a, a briefing from departmental officials um, on, on the plans that um, are going to be brought forward in relation to flexible school starting age. Or, would members agree? Agreed, Chair. Agreed. Thank you. Um, obviously, a welcome piece of news, but would be good just to see the detail in relation to that. Okay, another issue I'd like to raise is, is special school staff that vaccination. Um, we obviously raised that with departmental officials last Wednesday, um, and I asked for a time scale. I was advised that the hope was it would be days. Um, we're now a week later, um, and I don't think we got the clarity that we would have hoped for in the Education Minister's questions yesterday. So would, would members agree that we, uh, we write again to the Minister to... Um, seek his urgent clarification with regards to um, which special school staff um, will be receiving this vaccination and when. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members. Um, sure, just on that one. Uh, yes, Justin. There, there can be no justifiable rationale for, for vaccinating some special school staff and not others. It has to be a strong or firm point. I think that, that, that the committee was, was had a clear position in relation to that, Justin, and it, it was my understanding by looking at the, um, the, the principles behind the, the vaccination that it would be um, staff engaged in close personal care, which I had understood would, would probably include um, the vast majority of staff. So it would be, would be good to get that clarification from the minister as a matter of urgency. Um, I think we're all receiving correspondence on a fairly daily basis um, from uh, from special school staff that are, are, are quite concerned, if not afraid at this moment in time, um, and, and we really need clarity on that issue as a matter of emergency. Okay. Uh, uh, draft minutes then, members. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 10th of February 2021, page 6 of your meeting packs? and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising. And that allows us to move to agenda item five, which is our uh, first oral briefing from Action for Children on their Blues program and the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework. Can I ask? Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses. Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 13, briefing papers from Action for Children at page 15, and correspondence from Action for Children at page 83. Can I welcome Lorna Ballard, National Director, Action for Children, Sheila McMullen, Campaigns Advocacy and Policy Advisor, Northern Ireland, Action for Children, Emma O'Neill, Service Coordinator, Blues Programme Action for Children, uh, and Rhonda Murphy, Service Coordinator, Blues Programme Action for Children. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give you 10 minutes to make an opening statement, which will be followed by questions from members that can be answered across the panel of witness. Can I also say uh, a big thanks for joining us today. Uh, and give you a very sincere and, and warm welcome. Uh, the committee has, has obviously had a, a priority interest in 
the physical and mental health and well-being of children and young people at this time. Um, we've heard great things about the work uh, that the Blues programme is doing and we, we really look forward to hearing uh, a bit more detail about that. So we'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. So I just want to start by thanking you for the opportunity to present to the committee today. <clears throat> I'm Lorna Ballard. I'm the National Director. Thank you for the introductions. Um, I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves just as we go through our, our presentation. Um, Action for Children offers a wide range of services across Northern Ireland and while mental health and emotional well-being is a core element of all the work we do, we offer services that specifically target young people's mental health. So we'd like to talk to you this morning about the importance of our Blue Service, which we view as part of a continuum of support offered across across the statutory and voluntary and community sectors and is really vital to the well-being of our young people. So as we're all keenly aware, the mental health of our young people is suffering now more than ever with the impact of the pandemic over the past year. And um, the Social Care Board Commission Mental Health Prevalence Study told us that in Northern Ireland, one in eight young people struggle with emotional difficulties, but more recent data shows that the number is um, one, in half, one in five and the situation is Lorna, could, I, could I, sorry to interrupt, can I pause you for one second and just ask sure. if anyone who isn't uh, speaking um, mute their device. It, it helps with the audio quality of the of the person presenting. Sorry to interrupt you, Lorna. Thank That's you. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. So um, we also we know that the rates of depression and anxiety are twenty five percent higher here in Northern Ireland, excuse me, than they are in other nations. So we would just like to start by sharing a short video with you that raises the voices of some of the young people that we've supported through the Blues Service. And co-production is a core principle of our work and our young people have helped shape services and have really championed a number of initiatives, including most recently in the production of um, a, a journal by students at Straban Academy. And that was designed to support young people with emotional well-being. So after the video, we'll do we'll provide some more details about the Blues Service and its vision, its impact, and we'll look at how it fits into the larger framework of commitment mental health services across Northern Ireland and then we'll be happy to take any questions that you have so I'm just going to hand over to my colleagues here and we'll start off with that video. Apologies um actually I've just seen that we have to run Chrome to share a video and we don't our IT blocks that on our thing. So unfortunately, it won't be possible at this time. Maybe we'll just move on, on to the presentation with the full um, yeah, details of how the Blue, 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 Blues programme operates. I'll hand over to Emma O'Neill and we'll hope to share that video with members if they're interested in the future. That'd be great, Shana. Thank you. Thank you. Emma, do you want to go ahead there? Hi, thanks very much, Sheena. Um, unfortunately, it looks like I'm not able to share the presentation also. Um, it's not it's not letting me actually through share a screen because of the Chrome option. Maybe, Emma, you can just um, give a yeah. presentation in about five minutes and then I'll take from there. Yeah. Um, apologies. Every, uh, apologies. Um, no problem, Emma. I do have um, I do have an amazing presentation, but um, I'll, I'll just have to um, speak if that's okay. I'll, Can I'll, everybody... ask, um, I'll ask in the background if there's any way around that that um, that technical issue, and and if you go ahead and speak in the meantime, at the very least, I'll I'll try and make sure that we share those materials and as far and wide as we possibly can after today, yeah. if, if we aren't able to get access to them for you. Apologies mm -hmm. about that. No, no problem. Um, you, it's just um, I did uh, spend some time um, creating some uh, nice visuals, which will go to waste. But um, you'll just have to be entertained by my speaking instead. So, <laughs> um, okay. So, um, thanks very much again, everyone, for letting us um, come on board to this um, space. So, I'm M O'Neill from Action for Children. I'm one of the service coordinators for the Blues Program. So, really, what is Blues program. It's one of our core services and it focuses on um, the mental health and emotional well-being and building resilience here of our young people um, within Northern Ireland. So the Blues program, it's evidence-based. It's a six-week group intervention for 13 to 19-year-olds who have early symptoms of anxiety and depression. The program is based around the principles of CBT, so the, um, that's cognitive behavioural therapy approaches and aims to reduce participants' mental health symptoms and boost um, their confidence, which is very important. 
So again, it is an evidence-based program, um, and it was developed to tackle the reality that 75% here of adults with lifelong mental health difficulties first experience symptoms before the age of 18. So using the early intervention and prevention strategies, young people have the opportunity to learn and practice um, skills in an, um, that are effective in decreasing mental health symptoms that they can use both in their current day-to-day -day lives, in school, you know, in their private home, and also more importantly in the future. So Blue, we've been delivering successfully here in Northern Ireland from 2018. And to date, we have delivered in 41 schools. So we are actually actively delivering in some schools now, but I'll talk to you about that in a wee bit. Um, in terms of funding, Royal Mail was funding the programme initially um, UK-wide, so not just Northern Ireland, from 2008 until March 2020. And now here in Northern Ireland, we're availing of corporate fundraising until June 2021. So, so we don't have that much time left, really. So... Um, the next slide, really, assessment and engagement. So again, shame about the visuals, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're all still listening. So how does it work? So I guess at this stage, it's important to note that the Blues programme, it is completely voluntary for the pupil themselves. Um, so if they don't want to be availing of the programme, they don't have to. So bear that in mind, you know, when we're talking about our stats and engagement. So we use what's called a CESD. So you have to bear with me here because quite often I get the pronunciation wrong, but it's called um, Center for Epidemiological um, Studies Depression. So this is the questionnaire distributed to our chosen year group. And we use this CESD to monitor and measure outcomes before and then after the Blues program. So that's really important in terms of capturing the evidence and monitoring the outcomes. At this point, the relationship with the linked teacher, it's pivotal as they assist with the class organisation. They distribute the CESDs and um, remind the students, you know, to, to attend the programme. And they're also very good at advocating on, on Action for Children's behalf within their school and other schools. So um, from 2018 to 2019, within that academic year, we had 1,332 pupils who were invited to participate in the Blues. So 85.3% subsequently choose to enrol within the program and 77.9% of those enrolled and went on to complete the program. So we have got better really at engaging with our pupils and our teachers. And this has been proven within an increase in enrollment and engagement each year. So this is evidenced by, for example, within then the 2019 to 2020, out of then the 1,357 pupils who were eligible to commence our program, 94% sub subsequently chose to enrol in the program and 85% of those who enrolled went on to complete the program. So this is an increase of 7.1% from the previous academic year. So we think this is really impressive, really, considering it is voluntary, you know, from the pupils' perspective. And then when we talk, we talk about outcomes quite a lot on our evidence-based programme. Um, so I had some really nice visual demonstrations here, but basically, in a nutshell, what it what it, the visual demonstration looks like is the average pre-blue CESD, so the questionnaire before the, the, the blues program, the average score for a pupil here in Northern Ireland um, was 30.1. But then after the blues program, that score decreased to 21.4%. So this represents an average reduction of 8.7 points. Now, this this here, you know, the, 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 the decrease, this demonstrates decreased symptoms of anxiety and depression. And it's also worth noting here that this, this is a greater reduction than our UK average, which is 7.7, 7.6 points reduction. Um, so Northern Ireland, 8.7, the rest of the UK, 7.6. And then some other stats. Um, the, the, this, the stats is collated from the students, you know, during the programme. So the programme highlights that over 75% of 
our 2,061 pupils who completed Blues in Northern Ireland have noticed improved relationships with their friends, their families, um, teachers in school, as well as um, improved self-esteem. So this is all outcome measured. This, I guess, demonstrates that the, not only is the quantitative data um, not only is quantitative data, it is also demonstrating the positive outcomes for young people around improved mental health. But the qualitative data we collect shows significant improvements in our young people's emotional well-being and their ability to learn and succeed. Some other stats, um, sorry, I know this is maybe hard to take in without looking at the graphs, but we have um, delivered successfully 219 six-week courses to date. Now, 2,061 students have completed the Blues and that, um, when you look at Northern Ireland in total, that's 41 post-primary education schools, including alternative education schools. Now, some of the feedback, so I'm just going to try and read out feedback here. Um, Emma, I think we might be getting the slides on screen here if we want to give you a second to try and... Um, oh, right, okay. We want to try and align the, the slide to um, where yeah. you're at in the presentation. Do you know what slide number it should be, Emma? I do. Yeah, slide six. Slide six. Let's see if we can get to slide six. For you. Can you see the slides on your screen, or is it is it just us? Uh, no, I, I can't see you guys you at all. Okay. Now, so I'm, not, so I, okay. I'm just chatting. <laughs> well, we can, we, can, we can see and hear you loud and clearly. Um, okay, perfect. So um, I'll, okay. I'll read... I'll say slide six and then maybe slide seven and if someone can continue to move them, if that's that should, okay. That should work, yeah. Um, okay. Let me just tell you where we're at. We're at pupil feedback. feedback. Yeah. 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 Is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so feedback from schools. Feedback from um, schools. So that which is should be slide six. So the, the feedback, I won't read it all out here, but um, this is feedback before COVID. So I guess this feedback highlights the students are gaining confidence and learning in a, in a more positive and confident manner. Um, and then if we move to slide seven. Um, yeah. So this is um, clearly feedback from students. Um, so I really like this feedback because it highlights um, the student is basically stating that they feel less alone and of course that the staff are lovely which is always an added bonus um also to say that 100 percent of the pupils who respond advise that they would recommend the blues program to a friend and then if we move on now to slide eight um so this is around you know um coronavirus and moving forward and what the organization are doing so um, in slide eight, basically, the impact action for children, we have responded with speed and efficiency to COVID-19 pandemic, as, as most organisations out there are currently doing. But we are gearing up for existing services and also creating new opportunities. So the impact of um, COVID-19 on the daily lives and education of our children, it, it's been absolutely huge, as, as we all know. So we remain dedicated to providing mental health well-being support to students to enable them to succeed both in school and also at home because we you know our students are learning at home now um, in terms of wider support in order to support students and families we are collaboratively working with other organizations internally and externally we're linking in with hubs for example emergency funds signposting to other services where necessary and then we're also expanding on services so this is Action for Children, it's recognising the wider impact of COVID um, and the fact that we have to expand our focus really to ensure that we are appropriately responding to the needs of the wider communities. Um, so if we can then move on to slide nine, please. So what does this look like? What are we doing actively right now? Um, you know, this is all about what we're doing. So the, we, you know, as I said, the Blues program have evolved due to recent events, and this can be um, this can or the Blues program. It can be replicated in community spaces such as youth clubs, third level education, FE colleges, and more. So we deliver through face to face or digital. So the next couple of slides is going to outline exactly what we're doing. Excuse me, um, I'm, I'm just so conscious of our time and I'm wondering if the members um, 
yeah, I just would like to speak a little bit to the policy angles, and I know we had a bit of delay with the presentation, and I'm wondering right. if we can talk a bit more of the, the ins and outs of the ser service delivery in question time, um, or mm -hmm. are we flexible on, on, the, on the current time frame? We, Tina, we were, we were unusually timely in uh, our start of the meeting this morning, um, so yeah. you, you, I can give you a wee bit of flexibility here, but yeah, if we, if we um, okay. try, and, try and cover the rest within the next five minutes, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. No Emma, is that okay if I just yeah. step in here now, yeah. or do you want just to finish that wee one there? Let, let Emma finish up there, sure, then we'll move on yeah. to Sheena. Yeah, right, thanks. yeah, perfect. So, um, okay, so we're doing a physical delivery and we're also doing digital delivery. So in terms of physical delivery, that was looking, you know, physically within the school. Um, and then when we look at digital delivery, um, that is, um, it's through the platform of Microsoft Teams. So this is a newly developed means of delivering remotely to group sizes of between four to six pupils. So it's interesting to note that we are currently delivering this um, in some of our schools. And one that's highlighted would be St. Louise's um, High School in Belfast. So during Children's Mental Health Week, you know, you might have read it within the media. Um, so we're currently delivering to 34 pupils. And then um, we look at Bouncing Back. So th this is a program um, and it provides practical techniques and strategies to promote our emotional resilience and well-being. Um, so this package really, it's aimed at students between 12 and 19 and the intervention can be tailored to from one to one to full classroom setting. So I guess within the Bouncing Back, um, I want to sort of talk about this quickly. Um, this is interesting in this program because the Blues program is evidence-based outcomes led, um, but you have to meet the criteria. Within Bouncing Back, this can be delivered to a full year group, so they don't have to meet a criteria. So it's non-assessed support. Um, so more we know more people are struggling and these historically wouldn't have reached our criteria. So we, assist, so we have successfully, successfully delivered to 1,500 students. Um, and preparing to deliver cohorts to students right now um, within the Belfast area, Downpatrick and Derry and London Derry. So we actually have five schools commencing next week in this bouncing back. So this is evident that we are still going strong in the middle of a pandemic. And if anything, the needs are the needs are more. Um, so we'll skip then to let's say Emma. Sorry, I think I need to just come in there now. And um, okay. I, I, like I said, I, I submitted quite a lot of this evidence to all the members earlier. I'm sorry for cutting in. Um, no, that's it's fine. Just, it's fine. Well, thanks so much, Emma, for that, and really appreciate all the the work you put into that and all the work that you've put into to to deliver in the blues um, in Northern Ireland. But mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, Chairperson, I'm just going to yeah, um, speak. Sorry, just speak along the lines of the policy frameworks, um, because now you hopefully have a bit of an idea of the vision, ethos and impact of the Blues. But um, I'd like to just begin by saying that we know we're not the only organisation in this space and we highly value collaboration and acknowledge the, the other organisations as well as the school themselves and the vital contributions they make to the bigger picture of supporting emotional wellbeing in Northern Ireland for our young people. Um, but we want to share some of our observations of operating within that system and maybe some of the shortcomings um, and, and offer just, I guess, feedback on how we could see um, how universal programs in schools could become and should be strategically coordinated as part of a whole system in a way that accurately caters to the wide range of needs in our communities. Um, and I wish we did have more time to, to, to fully explain how that works, um, but hopefully we can get more into that in, in our conversation afterwards. But we are delighted in the context of the, the draft mental health strategy and the educational framework that pay direct and accurate homage to universal level, holistic and multidisciplinary approaches within schools. And we acknowledge the 5 million made available by the Department of Education towards the implementation of this framework and from the Department of Health to provide an additional 1.5 million from this year onwards. At the time of the Restart Wellbeing Fund, there was an understandable outcry when the, the criteria around this money um, was restricting investment in counselling services and new guidance was quickly issued to allow schools to use it in this way. We wholly support this proper investment of key services in our schools, but would emphasise that there is also an urgent need to adequately invest in high quality whole school approaches that engage with a broad spectrum of students, identifying the most vulnerable and then 
carrying out this way evidence-based program that has outcomes that that often turn um, symptoms of depression and anxiety and, and improved mood with reference to this point we would also note the excellent evidence recently presented by the secondary school students union which indicated that only 42 percent of students feel comfortable using counseling services which suggests including and resourcing a menu of approaches that have a wider reach um, is is a really positive and, and necessary step particularly in this moment of coming out through a pandemic in our opinion, it shouldn't be a case of either or, but more a case of both and, if we're able to tackle the extent of the issues that we're currently facing and are likely to increase as a result of this pandemic. We believe this kind of approach is supported by evidence, some of which we've presented and some of which I've submitted to you previously, and educationists alike, and also by the educational framework itself. However, at this point, I also want to draw your attention today to the progress report published this month by Nikki in relation to the still waiting report of 2018. I note that it indicates within the seventh theme of its recommendations that subject to funding, a pilot of two programmes to support resilience in post-primary schools has received an amber status, indicating that some issues are outstanding or perhaps it's not progressing. Perhaps the members know more around this pilot project, but I highlight it now mainly to underscore my next point. Within both strategies mentioned earlier, there are numerous statements outlining the need for better integration between statutory and community and voluntary sectors in order to harness the huge, and I'm quoting, skills and experience within the sector, as well as an awareness that schools are already engaged with providers to deliver programmes to their children, young people and or staff. Members will have received an extensive evaluation of the Blues programme that provides the evidence that Emma was referring to for its success in improving resilience scores in post-primary settings in many schools in many different areas of Northern Ireland. Essentially, my colleagues have already completed an excellent pilot programme dating back to 2018, also not only tested in Northern Ireland, but also in other UK nations. And they've even managed to continue operations through a global pandemic. However, this huge experience, skills and expertise risks being lost because of a lack of coordination and efforts. We need action in the here and now, and to us and many others like us, that means opening up new funding streams to be able to continue offering these vital services as well as a more politically coordinated system that will ensure equitable and consistent access to wellbeing services in schools across the region. We, we mentioned the corporate sponsorship and corporate sponsorships and research partnerships are valuable ways the community sector is able to try new ideas, gather evidence on what works or doesn't, and then develop and improve a service based on this evidence. However, it should not be depended on for delivering long-term core mental health services for our young people. And we believe that school-based programmes like the Blues should be framed in this way not as wholly separate from CAMS or counselling or GP referral count, um, processes or family support hubs. They all can and should play a vital role in offering greater access for young people to emotional wellbeing and good mental health. Like we have preventative health for our physical or even our dental health, we believe that these strategies are beginning to acknowledge that Northern Ireland is overdue a similar recognisable system that prioritises preventative care for our young people's mental health. However, we would suggest that the necessary funding structures around the current frameworks and their relationship to the community and voluntary sector are severely lacking in terms of responding both to the immediate needs and the long-term goals that are necessary to turn the current tide. We specifically came here today to ask that the Minister of Education is strongly encouraged to make a specific proposal for a portion of the COVID-19 funding that's rolled over, specifically for preventative and resilience building programmes within schools, with priority access to programmes already delivering, <coughs> excuse me, as well as opportunities for commissioning other initiatives that operate within the guidelines and the framework. We would also ask the committee, alongside their health counterparts, whether there is scope to explore if a portion of the confidence and supply agreement that anticipates 10 million for mental health could be earmarked for programmes, universal programmes in schools, in anticipation of the needs that are emerging and will emerge with reopening. 
Looking ahead, we would further ask that the departments involved in the strategic frameworks to design their long-term funding commitments with full sight of the contributions of the community sector to ensure adequate resourcing for the full spectrum of services that schools need support from. Without this kind of engagement with our sector, our society risks losing valuable programmes with all the tangible outcomes like the blues and the skills and experience that the strategies refer to. I'll leave it there and I thank you for giving us a bit of grace with your time and I think we can move now to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Sheena and, and colleagues. Uh, I, I will seek the forgiveness of my colleagues as well, Sheena, for giving you the flexibility that, that I did there with the time, but I, I, I did so and, uh, and I do so because the, the mental health and well-being of children and young people at this time has been a genuine priority of this committee and you've given us an excellent presentation this morning. You have given us evidence basis for how uh, the programme is achieving the types of um, recovery um, that, that we have been seeking to um, achieve. Uh, so extremely valuable evidence. Um, and, and you've raised a, a wide range of issues there. Um, I, I'm eager to learn more about how we can help you um, get a more coordinated system uh, and funding framework in place. Um, I'll, I'll move straight to my colleagues' questions, um, given that they have waited patiently for me, um, and I'll advise them that we have about six minutes um, per member for a question. I'm bringing Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the panel for their presentation there this morning. And it's obviously the, the issue of mental health among our children and young people uh, is one that resonates strongly with the committee. I recently received a, an answer to a written question from the Minister in regard to school counselling services, and I was concerned uh, that the, there is only minimal provision in post-primary schools and uh, currently no provision at all in, uh, in post-primary schools and no provision at all in primary schools. And I have been making the case recently that uh, given the serious situation we're in, uh, you know, the crisis we're in, and you, you, you may be aware uh, that Siobhan O'Neill, the mental health champion, presented to the committee a couple of weeks ago, and she agreed with the assessment that there's a tsunami uh, coming at us in terms of emotional and well-being issues among our children. Uh, and in the context of schools reopening uh, and, and the recovery program, I'm arguing that there needs to be a coherent, uh, integrated strategy to deal with the problems that our children are going to face. And that, that's, that strategy should be cross-departmental with uh, the health department and maybe with communities as well. It should involve outside expertise, the likes of people like uh, Siobhan O'Neill, and also uh, the skills that are available in the community and voluntary sector, as well as sporting organisations like the GAA, IFA, Ulster Rugby, uh, uh, and so on. And there's a, a need for this to be adequately funded. Uh, and there were some concerns about funding. And then we heard recently that that 300 million uh, for COVID responses is now being made available. So there's no real reason. And I know, Sheena, that you're asking us to bring pressure to bear on the, on the minister to make a bid for some of that funding. And, and I would certainly agree. But I'd like to hear what, what you think about this suggestion about an integrated strategy rather than you know bits and bobs of funding here and there and it being somewhat disjointed and piecemeal and ad hoc so i'd, li I'd like to hear your views about a, 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 an integrated strategy moving ahead thanks thank you very much um Maybe Lorna, do you want to speak to that? And I, and I can add my two cents as well. As um, I guess I'm sitting looking at all the strategies in the different departments at the moment as as the various consultations are open. But Lorna, I'll let you go there ahead, and then I'll, I'll maybe briefly after. 
Thank you, Sheena. So I think um, you make a very good point about the importance of a continuum of services, and we certainly see the Blues program as part of a continuum. It's not something that can um, that sits alone and that will provide you know all of the necessary services to young people. So it, it's important that we do have that range. Now we know that in the schools right now that counselling is is a focus, and that's a very important service. But um, the Blues is is sort of more of a preventative or proactive service that we could potentially be supporting young people maybe in whole class groups with the bouncing back service and then identifying the young people who meet that threshold on that assessment scale to go into the blues and we could potentially be um, mitigating that need for further and more intensive and more costly services down the road for a lot of young people and, and giving them a better quality of life. So so I think it is, it's um, vital for us to work across um, the different sectors. Um, and we have to work collaboratively so that there's a system for young people where there's a point of exit for everybody based on what their need is at any given time so that we can do a, a thorough assessment, make sure that they're getting the right kind of supports. And it may be that they need several different supports at the same time that maybe the Blues and an individual counselling short-term um, group of sessions that that would work for them. So, so I do think that it has to be a very individualised approach and we have to be very skilled at being able to assess what young people need and then have that range of services available in a very linked up kind of way so that we can very quickly um, get needs met because I think if you if needs go unmet then obviously you're looking at a more intensive need later down the road and we're looking at more crisis services so I think um, having this is almost like providing a safety net and we have to be very proactive and preemptive in terms of catching some of these issues early on and also I think um, just providing the education in schools like with the bouncing back service which has been so um, um, so well received by teachers and by parents and by young people um, that you don't have to have symptoms of mental illness to learn about resilience and to learn how to improve your emotional well-being. Everybody can benefit from that. And if we can prevent a young person from running into to greater need down the road, then why don't we provide them this service, which we can do in a whole class group, much more cost effective than waiting until that young person maybe is in a crisis situation and ending up in a you know an urgent crisis situation or you know needing some more intensive individual work. Thanks, Lorna. Sheena, do you want to come in briefly before I allow Pat yeah. uh, a final comment there? Yeah, Sheena? Yeah, I think I just agree with you, um, mainly as I do sit and I'm reading all the different strategies and the consultations and giving our feedback. I definitely see scope for a better integration and more collaboration, you know, between the departments, but also between the whole community and voluntary sector. And even sometimes I notice that schools voices are a bit absent in these conversations. And, you know, often it's just relying on Twitter to have to, have to be heard, for example, and I'm not sure that's the, the best process ever. Um, in, in these circumstances. So I do think that it would be a, a, a worthwhile vision and endeavour to open up new ways of engagement on these matters that, um, that would be focusing on integration and how we can all come together with our different viewpoints. And, it's, and it is potentially messy, but I think it, it has to be that in order to see the full spectrum of needs realised. Um, I'll leave it there for now because I know time is precious. Pat, do you want to make a final comment there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank, thank, thanks for that. And and I wasn't suggesting to exclude any particular organisations. I mean, each has a different role to play in in developing the well being of our kids in schools. Uh, some need more targeted intervention than others, uh, but even even in terms of the concept of integration, part of the problem will be when when children go back to school is that many will have fallen behind in their learning as a result of the difficulties of, uh, of learning remotely and so on, or it may be that they're suffering from emotional or psychological difficulties as a result of the, the pandemic and lockdown and so on. So uh, and you, you're probably aware yourself that, that sometimes the kids who have fallen behind in their learning are the same kids who are having emotional difficulties. So, so that's one of the reasons I believe that that integration should be taking place as well. Everything has to be covered, but I certainly, and I don't think I'll get any disagreement from the chair on this, that the committee should be writing to the minister and asking uh, to ensure that he makes a, a serious bid for some of the COVID funding that's available in terms of addressing the you know, this unprecedented crisis that's going to face children when they return to school. Thanks for that. That's a good proposal, Pat, thank you. Um, I'll bring in Robin Newton, MLA. 
welcome the delegation this morning. It very much is building on the uh, uh, session that we had with the uh, mental health champion. And I think we all recognise uh, that we are likely to experience mental health problems uh, uh, as the children return to school, pupils return to school. Uh, and indeed, uh, we start operating as a, I use the word normal, normal society uh, in, in the future. I think the, the statistics you've uh, uh, presented are, are very impressive. Um, I think th those, those are uh, giving a, a lot of food for thought uh, to, uh, and I'm sure all, all the members. I do absolutely agree with the need for a, for a holistic approach. Uh, I do think the Minister for Education does need to take the lead, but it does need also to involve health uh, and it does need to involve communities, uh, Minister for Communities. In fact, I would argue that we do need to involve uh, each of the local councils in, in a development of a strategy uh, right across uh, Northern Ireland. My, also, my fear is that, you know, some areas, uh, parts of Northern Ireland may take up the issue and, and other areas may be less enthusiastic about a holistic approach of, of this, this nature. So some pupils benefit greatly, some young people benefit greatly, uh, and then others uh, don't get uh, the same opportunity. So I suppose if we are doing this, um, and, I, and I do agree that we need to make a bid uh, for, for finance, uh, uh, probably tripartite bid, involving education, health and communities ministers uh, to deliver this program or, or to deliver a strategy, um, probably invol involving many aspects, uh, to, to undertake a, both a curriculum recovery uh, and indeed then a health and well-being uh, recovery at, this, at the same time. J just uh, maybe a, a couple of uh, practical questions. Uh, can you maybe just go into a wee bit more detail for me on how the Blues program is actually delivered uh, to, to the young people? Um, how often, time commitment, who, any training, those kind of questions? Can I become yeah. Toronto to answer that then? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, on a, on a practical level, um, I suppose the main thing is, as Emma mentioned in her presentation, our, our relationship with the schools is key. Um, so the way it would work initially is that we would link in with the school and we would have a link person, which is generally the VP or the head of pastoral care. And we would have a chat to them around a year group or um, whatever years they think we would like to run with, who maybe have the most need. Um, we would then come in, we work um, in groups, we have teams of four really, ourselves a coordinator in a group of four, so we, would, we are all trained in a two days blues, um, it's an accredited program which is obviously requires robust training actually and the founder, um, who is Paul Rode from the States, came over and trained us actually in it um, and it's only ourselves and actually we have the licence to to roll out the Blues program itself, and it's very much fidelity based. So we get checked in our work as well. So it's very important that what we're doing is what's in keeping with fidelity of the program. So staff are all trained and all obviously access and I trained um, and fed it as well. So we link them with the school, um, and then we would identify a year group which the school feel we'd like to work with. So say it was year 10, for instance. We would then meet with year 10, either in their form groups or in assembly. We'd give them a bit of background about the Blues and what's involved. And then we distribute, which is really our assessment criteria, which is our CACD um, for depression scale. And that's, a, that's an assessment tool of 60 questions, actually, 20 questions. And each young person then would answer how they're feeling. Some questions would be around um, their mood and anxiety levels. And we get an indication of how they feel. And a young person who scores over 20 on that, um, the maximum score being 60. And a young person who scores over 20 would be deemed as being eligible um, in order to um, be able to come on the programme. As we mentioned, it's a choice programme. Young people choose to come on. So we would then send them an invitation 
um, to come along to the program. We would obviously meet with the, the teachers around the logistics. And as you know, in schools, there's so much going on with timetables and exam timetables. We work flexibly with the, with the head of year or the school to, to assert a time that we can come in. The program lasts an hour and it's for six weeks and it needs to be um, each week. There's a, there's a week in between, which is for home practice and for assignments. So what we teach them, what the strategies we go over in the program then, they go home and practice that. And that's the cognitive reframing. That's them changing their thinking. That's the CBT type stuff that happens at home. Then they come back and we discuss that and we look at a different strategy. So it's over a six week um, period. We have groups of around 12. I mean, ideally around eight in a group is ideal. We've had groups of 15 at one stage, 15, 16, which became more difficult because we're trying to give more time to young people who need it. So generally speaking, we have groups of about eight to 12 young people. So we could have, for instance, in a year group of 100 young people, generally speaking, about a third, roughly, in, well, in Northern Ireland, we have 35% return of young people who score over 20 who meet eligibility, meet criteria. So roughly, we would have maybe 35 young people out of a, a cohort or a year group of 100. So we would maybe then have, say, four or five groups. So we would work that with the school, how that best works. It generally happens during school times. We have tried to do some after schools, some to a greater or lesser extent of success rate, depending. Some young people, as soon as the bell goes, they're off and school transport and stuff could be an issue. Um, so we work with the schools and what we try and do is we, we try to alternate that sometimes too, um, that they don't miss history every, every Monday at 10 o'clock because then that becomes an issue for their timetable and for their history teacher. So we try and alternate at different times on the same day. So we work very flexibly. Okay. Go. Yeah. Thanks, Rhonda. Robin, do you want to make a final comment there? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 sorry, sorry, just let me get this right. It's a six-week program, yeah. one hour a week in school yeah. with some work that the pupil does at home. That's that's the program. Can I just and uh, 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 I don't. This is the wrong expression. Need need your reaction to this problem of the pandemic. That's the wrong expression. But in terms of whatever the reaction is, whatever the holistic approach to this is, it can't be just until we assume we're out of the pandemic, and then. It drops off. If this is to be successful, I'd like you to comment. Is this not a strategy that has to be embedded within our, our educational uh, health and communities system? Thanks for that, Robin. And and I'll get a short answer and move on to the next member. Thank you, Robin. Good. Thanks for those important questions, Rhonda. Um, yeah, well, absolutely. I think that's what we, we are. And Pitch, if we were, we were living the blues from 2018 to 2019 into 2020 before the pandemic and before COVID and seeing huge outcomes. And the mental health of young people has been issues with them then. And certainly we, we're aware of the pressure cooker that's going on now that we need now even more than ever. Um, I don't know if Shani wants to say anything else around that, but in a very short answer, absolutely. It needs to be a holistic, um, longitudinal um, um, option for young people. No, I thanks have that, nothing Rhonda. to add. Thank you, <laughs> Shania. Thank you for those questions. We're all important questions and, and helpful answers. Thank you. Can I uh, bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Lorna, Sheena, Emma, Rhonda. Thank you for your presentation. And under the, the technology field circumstances, you've done very well. You've, got, you've maintained your composure and presented very effectively. So thank you. Um, in terms of the stats which you've you've talked about and you've, you've talked about being, about being an outcomes based data driven organization i wish our executive could maybe learn a bit from how you 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 guys performed and um, that's very very important there's one stat i'm just a bit confounded by you say that the secondary schools 42 percent of pupils feel comfortable engaging in uh, counseling services whereas you're getting you're reaching figures of 94 percent of students who I chose to enrol in this, this course, which is incredibly positive. How do you explain that disparity? Um, 
I'd be happy to answer that if, if you're happy enough, um, Sheena. Um, I think as a number of reasons, obviously, I think as, as the years went on into your first year, our engagement was around 84 and our completion was 77. But in year two, as Emma said, we are now looking at 94% of young people who engage and then 84 who actually complete. And that's to do with a few things, actually. Um, just really, I suppose that we've got better in our delivery from, from year one to year two, we've become more skilled. We've become more akin to how young people engage with us. The schools, once they start to see evidence of how young people actually are more engaged in their learning, their attendance at school being better, pastoral care and head ahead of year seeing that there's less pupils at the doors looking for you know the low level stuff that sometimes maybe takes up a teacher's um, response during the day. So once the schools have seen that it's a benefit in the pupils and benefit in the school as a whole, then the teachers have been more inclined to really really encourage their attendance. Uh, and to encourage pupils to attend um, and to make sure the timetable. I mean, schools have really worked so so flexibly around us to make sure that we can come into the school so much so that we're delivering digitally and five schools just now to pupils at home and their platforms. So I think we've got better. I think also, which is really important, is that um, the stigmatism around mental health has lessened in schools. When we first went in, we were called the Blues Programme. There was a wee bit of worry from our point of view about how we'd be deemed with the pupils. Um, and that has really turned in its head. Um, we started off that young people were calling us the depression sessions, and now we have young people are, are ambassadors for us. We have young people in schools who now are part of a mental health committee within their school, and they are advocating for the younger pupils. So say year 13, 14, who've been through the programme, they're now encouraging year 10 and 11, you know, this is great, this has really improved my mental health. So that has been a turnaround, and it's not just a six-week program, which is really important. This is a whole school approach to how we can destigmatize and improve young people's mental health and build their resilience, and that's okay. what we're doing. That's added value, but so if that answers your question, that's how we've got better engagement. And I think counselling's not for all young people, but group work and the, the peer support they get is. Okay, thanks, Thank Robin. You. <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's a positive observation, so it's a, I'm, a, I'm commending you on that piece. Um, in terms of the, I believe strongly that um, where focus goes, energy flows, and I think focusing too much on preventative, as opposed to uh, as opposed to the resilience building piece. I think change preventative to strength building. I think that's and even in the, the tightening blues program. I don't really want to go on a blues program. I want to go on a happy program. The blues program, you know, so the naming, the labeling is all important. Just give give that some thought. In terms of the S or CESD scores, right, where you have 28% who are um, whose CSD score has reduced by half, which is fantastic. Um, you've got 46% who's reduced to under 20, um, and 78% whose scores have reduced. What about the 22% whose scores have not reduced? Um, yeah, um, there, there can be a number of reasons why a score will stay the same or stay high. And for some young people, it um, can be a number of reasons. It can be that actually they have a lot going on within their, their households. It can be that there's been a change within six weeks, that something happens within a young person's life that actually can increase or their levels of anxiety or their levels of, of, of mood. Um, it could also can be that young people who we, we weren't aware of, the school weren't aware of that were suffering with anxiety or mental health, that we've been we've opened a can of worms a bit, but that but that's positive in that, that young people's now able to ex, to explore their mental health and how they've been feeling about things. So for for a few reasons it could be that the young person's struggling um, and there's stuff going on at home we're not aware of that we need to obviously support them with, or it could be that this is actually just the start of a process for young people. So for those twenty odd percent of evidence that their score means high or goes up, then we obviously will chat to the young person, we link them with the link teacher, then we look at the possibility of school counselling. They may be on the waiting list for school counselling or for CAM, so we will link in then with um, whatever agency we feel is appropriate. It may be an action for children's service, it may be that sometimes a safeguarding concern will come up during those six weeks, which which increases the score, and we work with we work with social work staff around that. So obviously, it's not six weeks. We obviously there's a there's a there's a, a plan around that that we support them. If their scores okay. increased, then we would look at what that individual need is, and look at what supports are ongoing for that young person. Justin, final final question. Yep, thanks. Um, the threshold is twenty, not CSC score to enter the program, but the baseline in the north is thirty. 
how do you how do you explain that that uh, level that that um, raise in the north? How do you explain that? Um, yes. I think there's a number of factors that are affecting our young people's mental health, um, particularly in the north. I think UK-wide, it's around 33% and ours is higher. In some schools, I know in some of the schools in Derry, for instance, um, we've had 45% return of young people. 45% have, have come back with a score of, of over 20. Um, I think that there's lots of issues around you know, how young people live in around. We know the issues around socioeconomic issues, around poverty, around young people's anxiety, around social media. So I think generally within the UK, the average score is higher than 20. It's around 30. And in Northern Ireland, it's a bit higher again. So I think it's all our um, intergenerational. It's all those issues, I think, that come into it, Justin, that it's hard to pinpoint one or two reasons. I think it's a combination of factors that are affecting our young people's mental health. We're aware that our, our high suicide rates are high rates of self-harming. All of those are impacting on those high scores. Okay, well, here, guys, thanks. thank you very much for your, your presentation this morning. Very important work you're doing. Destigmatise no area around mental good health. I'm just, I'm just worried that we're maybe possibly talking ourselves into a hole, talking about a tsunami of mental health problems. We need to sort of maybe more focus on the positives, more focus on positive facts for kids that, who are not hearing constant negativity the whole time. Thanks, Justin. Um, I, I, just, just to just to bank that that point there, the, the threshold for participation on the program is a CSD score of twenty, but the the average score of, of the of the average child in Northern Ireland is thirty. Is that is that what we were saying there? Yeah, Rhonda? I think thirty two. I think it was in the studies. So our average score. 20 is the eligibility, as in if they score over 20, they'd be deemed to most benefit from the programme. Um, but the average score UKY is around 32. So we're sitting just above higher average than the UK, but not hugely higher, but it is slightly higher. It's, it depends on different regions, it, it varies. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA? Hi, guys. Um, thanks for the presentation. Very, very good. Um, and as, as has already been said by the chair and by Justin, our apologies for the hiccups with regard to the hard work that had been in the slides and stuff. We did get seen some of them. So thanks for today. I've spoken to a few of you before and I'm really delighted to see you guys on here. Um, I know, Lorna, you had given an interview to um, a view, you did it digital there recently, um, where you had talked about um, the impact of COVID uh, on our children. So obviously, post-COVID, um, a lot of these statistics in and around the high prevalence of mental health across Northern Ireland and some of the reasons for that, uh, they're well documented. However, nobody could argue that COVID will not have had the detrimental impact. I'm mindful of what Justin said there because I'm, I'm with Justin on this, but we need, to, we need to be very careful with our language that we don't catastrophize everything. We do have some incredibly resilient young people. Um, uh, but the reality is, and I think one of the things that you said, Lorna, was that 90% of teachers surveyed uh, recognized that um, COVID would have a, a, quite a significant impact. Uh, on our young people. So my main question is this, guys. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about children returning to school, whether that's in a phased return or a full return or at a, a, a later date. I am absolutely convinced that the thing that needs to happen when, when our children do return to school, they need to return to a safe uh, space and an environment actually that looks after their emotional and mental well-being first before it delves into the curriculum and the lost learning. Um, would you agree with me, and that I'll let you expand on it, that uh, our young people um, who perhaps some of them were already suffering, but having suffered this disconnection, who are potentially even more anxious, having suffered either trauma and bereavement, uh, and those loss of linkages and friendships and relationships really need some, uh, uh, some concentrated effort um, to create that space. Possibly the programme might uh, actually help that. So I don't know if it's Lauren or she wants to, to speak to that, but I read a really good article. So... Uh, I'll, I'll show you my. Okay, I'll just come in and say, you know, you said it really well, Robbie, and I absolutely agree with you that um, if we don't manage some of the issues that have arisen because of the, the pandemic related to mental health, children are not be, going to be in a position to learn well and to thrive and, um, you know, realise their potential as well. So we do have to pay attention to that first and foremost. But I think, as another member said recently, it's something that we need to embed, that it's not, this is not just a one-off, this is not just something that we're dealing with today. I think it's something that has to be embedded in the system across education and health and communities, like we said, um, so that we're always addressing this and it has to sort of underpin education 
education because children can't learn if they're not safe and they're not emotionally well and healthy and at the, doing the best they can be the best they can be. So, um, so I, I think that's that's my answer. That yes, it is uh, vitally important that we address it now, but that we do it in an ongoing way. Thank you. In terms Great of the, in terms of um, the the post and uh, and COVID uh, study that you did, so you're looking at the the res responses of young people that you have contact with. And you're asking um, similar questions. What has stood out for you guys to be perhaps if we were to uh, triage the needs for young people um, in a restart and, and what that would be? Is there something that's glaringly obvious and something that needs to be addressed um, in terms of that, that, that level of importance? And the other thing, just I know you do a huge amount of good work with looked after children too. I asked the question yesterday with regard to the impact on looked after children. So there's certain sectors even within our young people and children that are perhaps even at more risk. So the minister picked out that they are vulnerable. However, uh, there's no doubt that they don't get enough uh, support and coverage and we don't talk about them enough. Um, so if you want to just address those two for me, please. Sheila, do you want to come out on this one? Yeah, I'm just I, I'm just checking. Were you referring to the questionnaire analysis about nine, uh, how things have changed during COVID, no. Robbie? That's the one, Sheena. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think probably for us, we we were looking at that impact data, and I think Rhonda probably is the one that's looked. Been, she's the one who's looked at the numbers most closely. So, um, I think maybe Rhonda can speak to that specifically. Yeah, um, I think we did a study actually just after the first lockdown, really around our CACD scores and how it impacted that young people. And when we were saying that the, the initial score um, for young people was around um, was 32, we looked at the scores actually had increased by nearly 6% for young people. When they came back after first lockdown, when we were doing blues, and so went up to nearly 38. So their scores had increased. So we're aware that young people, and if we actually unpicked some of those questions, which I think is what you're getting to, Robbie, but and the questions around, um, I feel as good as everyone else. Um, I think I have a top of your hand. Um, I think we were looking at 78% um, of young people actually in the UK wide were saying that rarely or, or never do they feel as good as everyone else. I think there were 65% were saying they, they felt hopeless for the future. Um, and we had only 4% of young people who were saying that they rarely, um, that they felt that they weren't having crying spells at least five to six or seven times a week. So when we broke those questions down, I felt depressed actually for young people was so high that actually 48% of young people were saying they felt depressed at least five times a week. So those figures have shot up for us and that's statistical information, I suppose, on a a more, you know, verbal quality of stuff that when we're working with young people, actually, since after the first lockdown, given we haven't spoke to them after, if we can call this a third lockdown, which we can imagine how that's feeling for them. I think the main issues were obviously feelings of isolation were huge for young people, which were affecting their levels of anxiety and anxious feelings, changes in family circumstances that parents obviously financially, there was young people that we know who are going to food banks and families who would never had experienced that before. And those young people who had possible or probable mental health disorders, were twice as likely to those young people who had to use a food bank and whose parents were in financial difficulties. Um, and also one of the main things for young people was around the fact that um, they felt that their mood, they found it difficult to get going, even with their schoolwork, they found that that difficulty with their mood um, and they were sitting screens all day, every day um, and not given any, any interaction or any social interaction as well. Um, and certainly the mental health of their parents has been an issue. So young people are suffering with their own mental health but we're aware of that secondary impact that as adults we're all we're all finding it tough and some adults and parents were find, are finding it tougher and young people are having the, the effects of those so there's statistical stuff to back up uh, young people's scores are going up and yeah. also feedback we're getting from them thanks that. robbie final comment yeah lastly uh, so one of the ones that i picked out of that there was uh, it was actually a, one of the decreasing numbers which was hopeful about the future um and I have to say, um, I, I know young people are incredibly politically motivated and very, very uh, uh, into um, liaising with us as, as MLAs, and it's brilliant. But I, f I feel for them sometimes when the, with the negativity that exudes from politicians uh, and storming sometimes. It's, 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 but one last one, I don't think it's picked up, and I don't know if you've covered it, guys. Um, uh, alcohol and, and drugs and, 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 and addictions and that type of stuff throughout the pandemic. I know that alcohol sales, for instance, went up. Um, over COVID and obviously you picked up the piece there, Ron, about when parents uh, or carers then are suffering from poor mental health or whatever. And obviously we do have addiction problems in this country, whether it's alcohol, drugs or gambling and so on. So when, when young people are exposed to that, 
And in the lockdown, has, was there, is there anything being picked out uh, in terms of that? Because just about every one of those probably went up um, in terms of those dependencies and addictions in households and young people obviously being exposed to them. There's a, there's a negative impact there too. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, I can maybe chat for just briefly about Blues and I know Lauren, if you want to say more from organisationally, but I know in Blues we have had some safeguarding concerns around young people where there have been households where there's been domestic domestic abuse, obviously, as also an issue, domestic abuse and, and, and parents' addictions have become more of an issue in relation to obviously how, how, how people are coping with the pandemic, but also um, parents who maybe had addictions, which actually have become more apparent and, and more of an issue. So we have had more safeguarding concerns around that, Robbie, which obviously is testing the fact that it is an issue for young people. Um, I'm not sure um, I'm wider than Blues, if there's any other information around that, Lorna, from a... Rhonda, if I, if, I could, if I could bring our next member in and, and maybe you can refer to um, so that answer and, and some of the future answers as well. I just got to keep us the time here. Apology. Thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Uh, thanks, Chair. Morning. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning. It is very much appreciated and very informative. Um, as other members have said, you, you know, this uh, tsunami, as um, Professor O'Neill referred to a number of weeks ago when she presented to the committee, is coming down the line. And, and we know that from our own constituency work. And I'm a governor in two schools and know from talking to um, educational professionals there as well, and also involved in youth work through the Scout Association. So one of the things we talked about a number of weeks ago was whenever young people do get back to school, um, how we reboot things. So obviously they're going back to school, but they've been off uh, from things like uh, youth organizations, uniform organizations, sporting clubs, and so on. Um, and this has all negatively affected young people in terms of their mental health development, physically, educationally, and so on. So I think this is not something which can be addressed by the education minister alone. Uh, it needs to be a joined up approach uh, across government in terms of regional departments of Stormont, but also with councils and also key players working in this sector. Um, how, I mean, I talked to um, uh, Professor O'Neill around this. We need someone to, to, to um, lead the charge in that, to, to, to coordinate and steer that. And I raised that with the minister when he was in front of the committee last week as well. I mean, first of all, would you agree and how best do you think you could see that working? Maybe I can answer that. Um, I 100% agree. I think that kind of central coordination is one of the missing pieces. It's certainly as an organisation, our sort of lived experience or felt experience is that you know, we've sat, we have this program, we, we know it serves the needs and it has potential to serve the needs of many other places and scenarios. But actually, you know, for example, educational psychologists that have been talking with had no idea that we're, we, this, this program existed or where we were operating or, um, you know, every time I've presented on the blues, it's been like a revelation. And, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no central place where, where we can uh, verbalize what, what we do, where we do it, how it operates and, and also have feedback of what others are doing and, and, and look at what, how we can coordinate better with that and how we can link into CAM services or counseling services. It's all a bit segregated and isolated and silo based. And I think, you know, we, we obviously call on the government to be interdepartmental, but I think it's also uh, incumbent on the voluntary sector to, to start making more moves. And that's certainly the heart and ethos of our organisation, that we we definitely want better communication and, and opportunities for communication between different organisations to coordinate, to collaborate, to try and, 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 and give that sort of central um, flow to, to the things that we offer. So I, I do 100% agree with you that that would be a really important sense of progress if that sort of person or uh, um, place could could be put into motion and it would be a very helpful thing for us and many others I believe. Okay. Any, any other ladies want to comment? Chair, can I just make the point, uh, um, I, I don't have another question because many of the questions I had have been, been addressed and answered. Sure. Um, can I just make the point again that, that, I, that I do think um, I'm happy to support letters going to the Minister of Education, but I think this is something which cuts across government uh, needs. I think the, the executive as a whole needs to take an approach around these issues with young people because the ramifications are not just going to be felt in schools or the, you know, the EA dealing with young people in terms of uh, youth work, but it, it, it stretches across the Department of uh, Health 
PHA, uh, the Department of Communities, uh, uh, and so on, and obviously local councils. So I think, you know, we need to keep pushing at a joined up approach across this. And I think all the executive um, uh, 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 across governmental approach is required around this, but um, because early intervention is cheaper and it's more effective and, and we're going to need that joined up approach, it will not be able to be addressed with a silo approach. Thank you very much, ladies. That's very informative and much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, William. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. And thanks again, everyone, for um, your presentations this morning. Really informative um, and really interesting discussion. So thank you for bringing that forward. It's also very topical. I think we um, most weeks at some stage discuss um, the mental health and well-being of children because of the pandemic, you know, so um, it's really good to hear from you. Um, the programme you do, the Blues programme, is based for teenagers. It's based on teenagers, 13 to 19 year olds. Um, I'm interested also in um, nursery school and preschool age. Um, I think we'd all agree that early inter intervention is key to helping children overcome any mental health issues they have or um, like just, to, just to support their emotional health and well-being. Um, can I ask your view on what can be done to support children in these settings? Yeah, I'm happy to take this question if it's okay. Um, when Earlier on when we spoke about bouncing back, which is another strand of blues, we've also adapted bouncing back for primary school education. So um, that we're just at the fact when I spoke about the organisation sort of adapting and evolving, you know, um, in the middle of all this, we've been making sure that our our delivery is fit for purpose and reach, you know, meeting the demand of our young people and our and our educators. So the feedback from schools is very much we want a program for primary education also. So we have actually just we're at very much at our final stages. We have the bouncing back program within our system and it's ready to go. And that's specifically for primary school age children. No, it's not the blues, but bouncing back has more more reach. You know, because you can deliver that to a full class setting, and that's very much looking at early years um, prevention, early years building on their resilience and learning be from other peers, which is a large, um, you know, it's a unique strand to our programs because some of the young people would say, I feel lonely or I feel sad. And then somebody else beside them is nodding their head and saying, actually, I feel like that too. So they're learning from each other. So um, the bouncing back, you know, it is there for primary school. And we're just at the stages that we're about to roll that out. And Emma, would that begin then at P1 or does that include nursery um, and preschool? Um, it, it really, it's most likely from P1, P2 onwards, but it depends really on the individual needs of the areas that we will be working in and the funding streams also. Okay, well, that's great Thank to hear that. Maybe can I jump in as well, just as a mini response? And and obviously the Blues is quite specific in terms of age group, but we do also have early year share start um, settings, you know, and that's kind of, that would be a sort of separate conversation. And, and I, I definitely have other things that I would raise in that area, but probably we, I suppose we came here today focusing on the Blues, which is primarily schools for, for older age groups. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Sheena. Thank you. Um, can I just also ask about um, kind of what areas, or like what schools you target? I know in the report that was published there, um, you really concentrated on Belfast, Derry and Downpatrick. Um, I represent a rural constituency. And I know I just at, at, um, at one of the points in your presentation, you were going to touch on Straban, but the video didn't work. Um, how do you kind of decide what schools to go to? Have you, do you communicate well with all schools? Or do all schools know that you offer this program? Um, what's yeah. the rural areas? Yeah, so we have um, so there's, um, we have areas within the the Belfast education area, within southeastern education area, and Derry, London, Derry, Amsterdam area. So it's really um, we will provide a service where we have the resources and where the demand is. Now we have had schools that have contacted us, but we don't have the resources to be able to put the program into that area. So we're very much active in Derry, London, Derry, Strabane area. And as a matter of fact, there recently in the media, um, some of the young people created a journal so they can document their emotions. Um, you know, it's like a live journal and the young people actually in Strabane Academy created that and it was on the media and we are using that journal UK wide now. So, and um, yeah, the report focuses on a, a Northern Ireland um, area, not just Belfast and Downpatrick. But I think it's also worth noting um, 
Now, we are actively um, delivering services now in the middle of the pandemic. So we have four schools within the Derry, London, Derry and Strabane area. And we have one in Belfast and uh, one here in Belfast and Falls Road and one in the middle of Downpatrick. So even in the middle of the pandemic, we're still able to deliver via digital platforms. Can I just add there too that it, that it is a resource issue that we absolutely have the capacity to develop teams if we have funding to support it. And I know that there has been there have been requests from other schools and we just haven't had the resource to be able to go and do that. And as um, we mentioned at the outset, the, the funding that we have is going to run out at the end of June for us. So we're, we're actually sort of actively beginning to wind things down a bit now unless something else comes along where we can maintain the, the skill staff and you know, the, the trained staff that we have in place to continue to deliver. Yeah. Well, Emma, first of all, just on your point there, um, that you're still um doing these programs through the, throughout the pandemic. That's brilliant, and like we're really pleased for that. Um, and the fact that you can do it digitally is great. And Lorna, on that point, then I just think that um west of the bam are often neglected and if it's a resource thing then we need to make sure that you get the the funding for that there because so because I, I know I, the, the program sounds brilliant and i can just imagine so many schools in um my area in west Tyrone would benefit from it as well but thank you all very much for your time there that's me chair thank you thanks nicola uh morris bradley mla uh, can you hear me chair Morris, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I take these off. Then builders next door, and I can't hear half time. Uh, can, can I thank everybody for their for their presentation? I find it very interesting and informative. But I was also impressed that eighty five percent of the pupils invited to take part went on to complete the, the program, which was uh, very high. Uh, the data you, you gathered suggests that you have taken part in uh, that those pupils who have taken part in the Blues program have gained in confidence. Uh, not only in education, uh, but in social interaction and building friendships. Everyone today has expressed concerns that mental health issues are, one, are on the increase and among children and young people especially, particularly children, including the fear and distress during this lockdown. Uh, and you've explained a good work in relationship with our, our other organisations, uh, but sport and physical activity is a major part of children's development and a great way of relieving stress and building friendships. Can you evolve your program to work with other community or sporting organisations, as well as schools and statutory bodies? Currently, the Blues program is offered in schools because that that seemed to be the, the, the best platform to actually access young people, but it's, it's entirely mobile. We can take this program wherever, really. So it's a, a team of professionals who will go in and provide the service. So just because it's in schools right now doesn't mean that we can generalize that. So this is something that could be offered in sports clubs or in faith-based um, organizations, youth clubs. Really, we could take this anywhere and then sort of deepen that connection with um, with our colleagues across the sector and uh, you know that, that communication that really will support um, a more integrated system of well-being for young people. Yeah, it might be worth saying in other parts of the UK, um, we have successfully recruited Liverpool F F Football Club Foundation actually now offer the Blues to some of their in their, in their coaching as do the Ospreys um, rugby in Wales. So there's been lots of talks with sporting, quite high profile sporting organisations who are now delivering the Blues and they've called it on target or they've called it obviously something around a sporting sort of theme. Some of it was picked up around the name and the connotations of the positivity around that. So it has been um, in other parts of the UK and we would ask Lauren and Mentor would certainly welcome that and it is adaptable as a flexible programme. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for that. David. I, I was also thinking along the lines that uh, your community and sporting organisations could augment what you already provide in schools. I was thinking about involving the sporting organisations and community bodies in the work that you do in the schools. Uh, so thanks very much for that, that answer. But can I ask how the programme can be tailored to take account of the stresses experienced by, by children who attend special education, children who may have a disability uh, and disability restrictions? Uh, many, for a want of a better word, have been incarcerated at home and isolated because of lockdown. So can your program be tailored or expanded, uh, perhaps would be a better term, to focus on those children who are in a special education situation? Yeah, the programme has been adapted, yeah, um, for special needs settings, actually, and we've delivered it quite successfully. I think Emma may be able to um, allude to that because they have delivered it in Belfast, but it has been adapted, yeah, um, for special education settings. 
Yeah, um, Morris, we have delivered um, in a Ardmore education setting in Downpatrick um, a year ago to a group of eight young males. Um, with um, there was certain different complexities around their individual needs, and also you may have read at that time there was um, unfortunately a snowball of high suicides within the area, and also had that had directly impacted on this group. This friendship group. So the school had contacted us through the early learning coordinator and um, had spoke to us about if we if we could if the program was suitable and if so how could it be implemented within the school. So it was just about looking at the staff ratio, for example, um, because of the individual needs. The blues is also converted to um, consider dyslexia, um, autism, ADHD. So there's different strands of the blues depending on the you know the need, individual needs of those um, students within the year groups. So we. Successfully deliver now. It started off as eight meals and um, five five completed. Now the other um, the other ones that didn't complete actually had progressed right through to week four. And unfortunately, um, just because of their environmental circumstances, they didn't complete the other two. However, we did work very closely with the school and leave the resources. And it was left on a note that we would happily come back and complete the final sessions with uh, those. Mm -hmm small group of um, young males but the feedback from that group was incredibly high you know and that they would they would have stated at that time that they hadn't received one-to-one -one tailored intervention like it before in their history of education you know because we had increased our staff now you know that was rare in a sense because we had resources to be able to do that so it, it depends really on the the staff availability and um the demand, I guess. We also have um, other skills that have approached us, but as, as what we've all been talking about, and Lorna has just said there now in the last previous question, we are coming to an end if the funding isn't renewed in June. So we're actually, from March onwards, not going to be taking any new bookings, but some of those new inquiries have come from SEND schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just to finish off, Chair, and thanks, for your, thanks for your patience. Uh, as well as lobbying the education master, I would support an holistic approach because I believe children should be our main focus coming out of this pandemic here. Uh, they have lost so much during their formative years, not just education, but physical well-being, sporting and social interactions. So I think the problem is really a, a, a cross-executive problem and it crosses many departments, if not all departments, and I think it should form an executive-wide response. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Morris, for those important questions. Um, just before I, I round this up, um, folks, the, what, what is the significance of the Early Intervention Foundation um, awarding the Blues Programme its highest possible rating in terms of the strength of evidence for the outcomes it is achieving? Um, maybe I'll speak to that just initially. Um, I suppose it's it was with reference as well to the educational framework for wellbeing that that would be one of the standards through which you know different programs would be judged as suitable for schools to, uh, you know, it, it talks about offering a menu of options to schools and but they would have to have a certain standard um, to, to qualify. So I suppose to have that highest rating, I think probably it, it just it stands us in good stead as, an, as a good choice for schools. We do have that history of evidence behind us. It's been scrutinized by an outside uh, body. It's not just an internal process. And, and I think probably Rhonda or Emma can speak more even about the different sort of fidelity processes that they go through as uh, the coordinators and as service delivery team because well, it, I, it, it is quite I, consistent yeah can i can i commend you on on achieving that that rating um and can i in the short time i have left ask how, how obviously you raise the uh, the challenge of of funding only being in place until june and i, I think all members today have um have universally recognised the uh, the outcomes being achieved by this program. So, um, what 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 is the impact of that funding ending in June? Who who how are you currently funded? So currently we're funded through a corporate partner. And initially it was Royal Mail that funding ran out last year, and then we had other corporate donation that held us through into um, the end of this year. So it was initially through March, but with the pandemic and just some underspent, we were able to extend that through June. 
So, so the impact, I mean, basically is that we're withdrawing from schools and, um, you know. So they say, Lorna, do schools um, procure the Blues programme? So, no, so that everything is done via the voluntary funding and action for children. So we have an engagement and a relationship with the schools, but they're they're not um, contracted with us and they're not providing any funding for the service. So the Blues programme is not publicly funded? It's not at all, no. No, okay. it's really and, voluntary from the team. Okay, and and do you have any meetings or engagements scheduled with the uh, Northern Ireland Executive Departments, Department of Education, for example, with regards to how um, monies um, allocated for children, young people's mental health and wellbeing might be able to uh, partner with the type. We have had some engagement with the Education Authority um, and also with the Trusts, but at this point uh, we have nothing else further scheduled, no. Have we lost them? I think we would have dropped out. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> have you got me back yet? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my uh, my uh, computer tends to gift me with at least one or two dropouts <laughs> per session. That normally the timing of them aren't as bad as that one. <laughs> um, apologies. Um, okay. So, sorry. Th just to ask that again. Then, do, do you have any meetings or engagement lined up with the Department of Education? We don't. We did have some engagement with the Education Authority and also with the trusts, the various different trusts. But the, there was no resource for any kind of to allocate any funding to the service. So at this point, we don't have anything else lined up. No. I okay. have also written to the, the Education Department um, seeking engagement, but I haven't received any responses as yet. Okay. Well, look, I think I think we as members um, will want to reflect on that for you and perhaps consider. What, what we can do in terms of engaging with the department um, to seek their engagement with you. Um, as you have said yourselves, there, there will be uh, a number of programs um, potentially uh, able to offer uh, the type of provision that you do. However, um, you know, the, the accredited strength of evidence that you um, are presenting in relation to this program um, has, has definitely been noted by the committee um, today, and um, notwithstanding the evidence that you presented, if the Blues program is delivered as effectively as your engagement with this committee has been, then um, I, I think we can rest assured that you're having the type of positive impact on the emotional health and well-being of, on our children and young people that we desperately need at this time, and as you've said, on an ongoing basis as well, um, the data. Um, doesn't lie in terms of the challenge that we face here in Northern Ireland. So, look, can I, in closing, uh, I think on time, excellent, um, thank you uh, for your, your evidence today and, and thank you for the work that you're doing on behalf of children and young people and their emotional health and wellbeing across Northern Ireland. And I'll, I'll be glad to maintain contact with you on behalf of the committee um, to make sure um, that we do have resources and support in place to make sure um, the like of the Blues program can be sustained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, folks. Okay. Okay, members, can I ask uh, the clerk to summarise any actions or requests uh, for additional information resulting from our briefing? Sorry, sure. can I also ask Assembly Broadcasting to? Um, remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and keep them there until our next uh, evidence session. Clark? Yes, Chair, I think the main action is um, to write to the uh, department um, uh, proposing um, that a uh, proportion of COVID funding um, for universal programs for resilience and mental health um, mm -hmm. be provided, prioritizing um, perhaps uh, programs like this one which are already delivering and um, so uh, evidentially uh, supported um, and also that a proportion of confidence and supply money might be ring fenced for universal mental health programs um, bringing in this community and voluntary sector um, 
Members discussed um, a coordinated approach and integrated strategy, giving scope for better collaboration with the community and voluntary sector um, and a lack of school voices at present. Um, and that this might um, avail of COVID funding that is available at the moment um, and allow uh, there be, to be a prepared state of affairs for, for school restart. Um, members discussed embedding this learning, um, so learning from programmes like this in the system for health and wellbeing recovery and to enable connect curriculum recovery and generally to provide some security of funding for such programmes. Um, so taking into account uh, in the pandemic context, the need to triage mental health for all children at this time, um, and then specifically vulnerable and looked after children um, about whom safeguarding alarms have sounded due to domestic abuse and parental addictions. Um, provision across uh, the region, um, so including west of the ban, um, as well as the kind of more metropolitan area, and uh, commending the accredited programs such as um, the Blues program. That's a really helpful, comprehensive uh, summary. Uh, David, David, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, Pat, come on in there. And I absolutely agree with you about the uh, Avian summary there. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, could we uh, insert the word ambitious uh, somewhere in relation to whatever the minister is making? Because given this is an unprecedented crisis, it, it requires more than just the run of the mill bit for some time. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Mem members content? Sure. Yeah. Can I just raise this? Okay, we'll take one at a time. I think we'll have Robin, and then I think I heard William there as well. Robin? Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, I think William's probably going to make the same point. It's really just that I, I, I'm in agreement with uh, the, the committee clerks. Uh, the Jume there, I think that's by and large me. Um, I don't think China last can last only in an educational context. I think this has to be a program that uh, is ambitious um, and it has to move outside the um, uh, educational sphere. Uh, and it does need to involve the likes of uh, clubs, uniformed organisation, that potential for the church. So I think we're, we don't want to keep ourselves thinking in a very, um, because we're the education committee, thinking in a, in a broader frame. It needs a broader approach, sir. Thank, thanks, Robin. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, just remind members as well, if you're not speaking, to put your device on mute. I think there's a bit of um, audio background. But yeah, no, I mean, I, Robin, I, I think we're looking at an, an executive children and young persons wellbeing recovery program here. And, you, and you're looking at, uh, as other members have frequently mentioned, educational wellbeing, emotional health and wellbeing, and physical wellbeing. And uh, you make the case well, that that's going to require Minister for Education, Minister for Health, Minister for Communities, uh, all almost all departments, I would imagine. It'd be, it, it might be worth the, the, the committee also writing uh, to the Minister of Education to ask how well placed the children and young persons strategy is um, in comparison to what, a, what an executive wellbeing recovery program would look like and indeed you know, Pat's reference to the need for a, an intensive and ambitious um, program with you know an ambitious scale of resources in there as well. So um, I think we can we can definitely look at that. Uh, was that William that wanted to come in as well? Yeah, it was very much along the same lines as Robin. Um, Chair, it needs to cut across government. Um, I have no difficulty with a letter going to Peter Weir, but equally, and uh, you raised the issue in the chamber yesterday about sports clubs and so on. You mentioned that we club in East Belfast and and, and, and whatever, but they, they, in terms of getting a sports club, that obviously it means communities, um, in terms of youth organisations and, and youth clubs and so on. We also need to encompass the, the um, local government as well, and you know representatives from the sport, the main sporting organisations, uniformed organisations. I think there needs to be a holistic approach that's not just governmental, but community as well, so that you're not just dealing with education, but you're dealing with sports, uniform organizations, youth organizations, churches, 
and get a joint up approach that gets a holistic approach to tackling the issue of the, of the emotional uh, well-being of our young people and not just education. Thanks. Okay, thanks, William. I think we need to have a think about how we might sure, could uh, I just prompt, prompt that then. Yeah, Pat, go ahead. And, yeah, and, uh, okay, okay, sorry. Thanks for alerting me, Robbie. I'll bring you in immediately after. Thanks, Pat. Uh, I, I, I agree with the thrust of what Robin and William have just said there, uh, that there should be a holistic, joined-up approach to this. But I think it's important also that someone has to take the lead and the responsibility in this case uh, falls with the Minister for Education. Uh, so I, I think the difficulty with involving too many people and not appointing a leader is that then we don't have a leader at all. And, and it's over the Minister of Education in this uh, and the lead in this matter. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Pat, Robbie. And I'll try and bring us to a close here because we are yeah. in your other sessions and we do have the curriculum sports program, which will uh, obviously reference the, the sports and physical education aspect of this challenge as well. Robbie? Thanks, Chair. Uh, brilliant to see the passion from absolutely everybody in this. And I mean, we're all pulling in the same direction. So the uh, outgoing Children's Commissioner uh, in England uh, made a, a pretty good statement over this past week in terms of what the commitment will look like from the UK government, from Westminster and, and for ourselves, obviously, we've got to look at Stormont here. So it has to be the collective piece. Um, I'm going to suggest um, that we then again, just maybe as a, as a matter of urgency, uh, could speak into our own Children's Commission or Kula because I think that would be fabulous. I mean, we, we can, I think it's almost better to get the children's voice here. So we all have our ideas as to who owns us. That's fine. We can all have our opinions on that. But here's the thing. The children's voice is the thing that's important here. So it's not about us telling them exactly what we think to be right for them. Uh, it's very important that we get the children's voice in this too, Chair. So I think before we absolutely nail this down as to what our suggested strategy would be, I think it's important that we hear. And I know in the next couple of weeks, we will have a couple of young uh, people's uh, organisations, Pure Mental ANI, uh, Secondary Students Union of Northern Ireland and Crisis Cafe. And I think um, if we could get the children's commissioner, that would be really, really important, uh, Chair. Wednesday, the 10th of March, Robbie. Yep. Okay. Any other members before we move on? No. Okay. Clark, are you content uh, with the follow up actions? Yeah. Okay. Could I, could I maybe add in, in that we suggest that the Department of Education um, respond to uh, Action for Children's request to meet as well? Okay, that, that would, and support the request to meet. That would be great. Okay, members, uh, thanks for that uh, productive evidence session. I'll move us on to agenda item six, which is our curriculum sports program briefing from the Department of Education, um, in line with our call for physical um, recovery. Also, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 89? Tabled papers from the department, namely correspondence, a briefing paper on physical activity in the sports programme, a briefing paper from the sports governing bodies on what they've been able to deliver uh, since lockdown restrictions began, a previous paper from the sports governing bodies at 93 to 109, assembly research uh, paper on physical education and pupil wellbeing at 110, Previous DE correspondence regarding sport and physical education in schools at 133. The Children's Sport Participation and Physical Activity Study 2018 at page 141. And an Assembly Research Briefing Paper on the Impact of PE and Physical Activity in Schools on Health and the Economy at page 249. Can I welcome Karen McCulloch, the Director of Curriculum, Qualifications and Standards at the Department of Education, Sam Dempster, Head of Curriculum and Assessment Team at the Department of Education, and Suzanne uh, Kingston, uh, Head of School Improvement at the Department of Education, and Madeline Mason, Physical Educational Specialist Inspector at the Education and Training Inspector. Can I advise witnesses that the committee would be glad to give them 10 minutes for an opening statement, followed by questions from members. Over to you. Thank you and uh, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this morning on the sports programme and physical education in our schools and thank you for the introductions. Um, as you say, in advance of today's sessions, we provided the committee with a short paper giving an overview of both PE in the Northern Ireland curriculum and specifically the sports programme delivered by IFA and GAA. 
Prior to answering your questions, I hope to set out some of the opportunities and challenges for the delivery of PE in our curriculum, the support for PE provided by the department, and our plans for the next 12 months. In terms of opportunities, we know that high quality PE fosters the physical, moral, social, emotional, cultural, and intellectual development of pupils. Where once PE may have been viewed as a more marginal or optional subject, society has increasingly recognized its key importance to all children and young people to support their physical and mental health and well-being. A high quality PE curriculum enables all students to enjoy and succeed in many kinds of physical activity and can empower them to make informed decisions on how to lead healthy lives. Developing regular physical activity in childhood is crucial. We know that children who are active and are more likely to become active adults and con continue to reap the benefits of an active lifestyle throughout their life. A key principle is physical education for lifelong activity. And just this week, Playboard NI has introduced a resource for parents of young children outlining play ideas and activities to encourage physical activity at home. Our schools can play a pivotal role in helping to develop positive physical activity habits through a well-balanced PE programme by increasing children's exposure to fun and varied activities across the curriculum and by creating more active environments so that pupils have regular opportunities for movement during their school day. In recent years, there is also a growing evidence base to suggest that physical activity has the potential to support learning more broadly. Research has shown that physical activity can improve short-term memory, reaction time and creativity. It increases attention span, coordination and complex thinking and enhances behaviour and academic achievement. There's also a significant body of evidence that engagement of young people in good quality PE and sports programmes supports the development of life skills such as leadership, organisational and communication skills, increased resilience and problem solving. In Northern Ireland, we have a flexible curriculum with limited prescription. Within a framework of first fundamental movement skills and then a balanced programme of, of athletics, games, gymnastics, swimming and dance, our teachers enjoy professional flexibility over how and what they teach in PE. This allows schools to tailor their PE programme to the needs, interests and aptitudes of their pupils. By Key Stage 4, the focus of PE is on the importance of healthy, active lifestyles and developing the needs, interests and talents of young people. There is also flexibility to allow schools to involve young people in the design and delivery of PE, which can significantly increase participation and enjoyment from this age group. We know from our district inspectors and our school managing authorities that prior to the pandemic and current social distancing restrictions, there is much good practice to be celebrated and many children are enjoying high quality PE, supplemented by rich programmes of extracurricular sport. Our teachers are highly committed to the extracurricular provision of sports in our schools, both in terms of their time and their continued professional development all to the significant benefit of our children and young people. Many schools have built effective partnerships with local sports clubs to further enhance PE and extracurricular sport. There's much to celebrate in our schools. We know, however, that as across all areas of the curriculum, there are a range of questions and challenges around the delivery of PE. There has been ongoing deliberation and debate about the purpose of PE, the amount of time spent on PE in a busy curriculum remains a challenge and we know from the school omnibus survey that only a small percentage of both primary and post-primary schools who responded are providing the recommended two hours per week of PE. There are questions about how best to develop and support the skills, capacity and confidence of both specialist and non-specialist teachers to deliver PE and how to engage those hard to reach children who don't do exercise is a key concern for schools and government more widely. Added to these challenges, the current pandemic has had a significant impact on the delivery of PE, extracurricular sport in schools, and on youth and junior sporting activities more widely. A number of studies have shown that closing community and grassroots sports has had a major impact on mental and physical health, with many young people having reduced level of, of physical activity. In the midst of these challenges, we have a very clear picture of what works well. Rigid prescription or timings for PE will do little to improve quality, but a whole school approach where there is clear commitment from senior leaders and governors to providing regular quality PE and extracurricular opportunities for all pupils 
will help to ensure it becomes embedded in the ethos of the schools. In effective practice, there will be a school-wide focus on PE as part of the school development plan, and provision will be improved through monitoring, review, self-evaluation, and effective planning. Like other areas of the curriculum, external support can be valuable, but it's only one aspect of improving and developing PE provision. In effective practice, planning will consider how coaching by external providers can supplement the PE programme and extend further the children's learning, including development of their wider skills and disposition and the learning of school staff. There are a number of key principles which underpin effective delivery of PE and which work to increase levels of physical activity amongst children and young people in our schools. These include supporting a skilled workforce by ensuring staff have the confidence and competence to offer high quality experiences. And in the most effective practice, schools will identify and support individual staff development needs. Embedding regular opportunities for time to be physically active in the curriculum, teaching and learning is important. Engaging a strong student voice, which can enhance pupils' ownership of physical activity and ensure that activities appropriate, are appropriately tailored to their needs and interests. Creating active environments is also important. Good access to and integration in the school day of open space, forests, parks and playgrounds are associated with higher levels of physical activity. Access to a range of equipment and stimulating play materials also support physical activity among children and young people. Offering choice and variety is also, also crucial and can help to encourage participation, particularly among inactive pupils. Above all, effective practice will embed monitoring and evaluation with the identification of baseline information, interim outputs and outcomes. In line with these principles, the department provides a range of support, guidance and investment to support the development of high quality PE across the curriculum. SEA produces a variety of curriculum resources to support the teaching of PE. And as you're aware, we have funded the sports programme delivered by the IFA and GAA for over a decade to enhance the delivery of primary PE. In 2019, reflecting both the evaluations of the programme and recent research evidence, the department worked with IFA and GAA to redesign the programme with a greater emphasis on promoting a whole school approach to quality PE prioritising the upskilling of our teachers and an increased focus on pupils' learning about mental health and wellbeing. As a condition of participation, schools are asked to commit to work towards two hours PE provision per week at Key Stage 2. There has also been significant and ongoing investment in modern state-of-the-art sports facilities for our schools. Since 2012, there have been 25 major capital works projects completed, generally providing a sports hall, gymnasium, fitness activity area, a dance and drama area, changing facilities, as well as bet excuse me, between two and five pitches and up to five training pitches and courts. 53 million pounds of investment has been provided through the school enhancement program to 17 post-primary schools who received investment in sports facilities, including new sports halls, gymnasiums, fitness suites, and pitches. The department has also delivered a wide range of schemes via the minor works process, ranging from upgrades to pitches and flood lighting, to shower and changing facilities, and improvements to sports halls. Through our professional advisors in ETI, the department has worked closely with the Department for Communities on its new strategy for sport and physical activity, most recently facilitating significant engagement with schools in the co-design of the strategy. We know from ETI's district inspection activity that we have a strong base in PE. Going forward, however, we believe it's extremely important to comprehensively evaluate the nature and quality of PE provision. We particularly need to consider the degree to which our schools have embedded a whole school approach to encouraging healthy lifestyles and exercise. As the committee is aware, inspection is currently paused and ETI's focus throughout the pandemic has been on providing practical at the elbow support to schools. As we hopefully return to more normal patterns of attendance, ETI may begin to resume a more evaluative approach, and we aim to pick up on work which began in 2018 to evaluate PE in schools. A thematic survey of PE provision is a key priority for the department. This work would begin with primary schools and progress to post-primary. Planning for this work had commenced, as I mentioned, in 2018, but was unable to proceed due to action short of strike and then COVID. 
The committee will appreciate the importance in the current context of getting the timing right for this survey. As we are all too aware, the delivery of physical education in our schools has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, so it will be important to allow schools time to return to more normal routines prior to the survey. Such a survey will provide an opportunity to consider key issues, such as the department's recommendation that schools should provide pupils with a minimum of two hours of curricular PE each week, the skills and confidence of class teachers, and any specific issues with pupil participation. It will provide a strong evidence base on which to inform and plan future interventions. In conclusion, we feel times have changed. We now know so much about the value of physical activity for physical and mental health and well-being, to pro promote positive body image in women and girls, to help people with depression, to engender a life healthy lifestyle from an early age, to sharpen concentration and academic performance. The department is committed to supporting our schools as they plan, develop and implement high quality phys physical education and increase opportunities for physical activity across the school day. We know that it's crucial to create an environment where PE is a priority for schools within their curriculum. In developing advice for schools on curriculum planning as they resume face-to-face -face learning, the department will be emphasising the importance of providing engaging activities with opportunities for collaboration, creativity, play and social interaction. Our intention is that as part of the recovery process, the summer term will provide opportunities to encourage outdoor play and an emphasis on being physically active. High quality PE, physical activity and play and well-planned extracurricular programmes offer a, a myriad of learning opportunities which will help our children and young people to cope with the challenges they've faced throughout the pandemic and as we recover. They can support children to re-engage and move on with learning and are positively associated with children's academic attainment and literacy. Thank you. Happy to take any thank, questions. Thank yeah, thank, thanks very much indeed for that uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a number of questions. Um, can I, uh, and I think we have uh, five minutes per member for questions, so I, I, I'll kick us off. Um, so what prior to the pandemic, what, how, what was the percentage of schools that were delivering the recommended two hours PD per week? In the last omnibus survey that we did, it was 2018. The two hours or more, there were just 5% of primary schools and 8% um, of post-primary schools. Um, I mean, most were uh, providing one to two hours of PE lessons, and that wouldn't include, of course, physical activities, such as their outdoor play or their daily mile or extracurricular activities. Um, but that was the figures that we yeah. had. Uh, and I have, yeah, th thanks for providing that and have those available to me. Um, the, the, the figures for two hours or more per week are truly shocking and have been for a number of years. 5% um, of primary schools, two or more hours per week, and 12% of post-primary schools, two hours or more per week. But uh, as you say, um, the, the way in which the data is collected is not entirely helpful either because the two hours or more bracket is then the one to two hours, um, which yes. is, a, is a significantly more. One to two hours per week in post-primary is 63%, and one to two hours in primaries is, is 57%. But obviously, that could be one hour, or that could be two hours. We don't know. Um, yeah. but, but the two hours or more is, is truly shocking. Um, and if, if that was any other part of the statutory curriculum, it would it would be a scandal. It would be a headline. Um, and and I, I don't know why it isn't, uh, to be frank. Um, we have had assembly motions um, calling for improved monitoring and reporting of physical education hours access by primary school pupils um, and a public consultation on the introduction of a statutory obligation um, on an appropriate minimum amount of physical education hours per week. Um, so that, that is truly shocking. Um, as you've rightly acknowledged, uh, the impact of COVID on physical education has been significant as well. What, what is, what is um, ETI's assessment of the impact of COVID on physical education? Are you happy to take that? Yes, hello. Uh, how are you? Hi, ETI. Um, 
Um, I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet here, you know. Uh, the key uh, question is, um, how do physical education teachers continue to provide during the pandemic? And I have to acknowledge the great work that's been done in schools um, during um, physical education time and timetable time. Children and young people are being set physical education activities, activities and tasks. It has had a major impact, of course, because they're not in school, they're not able to engage with their friends, they're not able to participate in physical education as we know it. Um, so it has had a major impact. Uh, I think what's key is that on any recovery programme, it needs to be at the core uh, to engage young people back in their learning. Um, I mean, you know, I know anybody who's a physical education person will, will know children go to school, and one of the key reasons why they go to school is to enjoy physical education. You know, we're passionate about it. We have to ensure that, um, you know, on, re on return to school, that uh, PE is at the core. I mean, we have tweeted, you've seen our tweets probably as well, we have said that PE is central. It's a key area for curriculum, and children will need to engage in it whenever they return to school. Okay. Um, I obviously wholly agree with you. Um, I the, was previously advised that the ETI would be commissioned to undertake a, a review of physical education um, yeah. and, and yet the, the, the minister has most recently um, responded to a question of mine to say that there there is uh, no review and therefore no update on a review available. Um, I think an action out of this will be to write to the minister and ask um, what 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 yeah, Chris, I, yes. 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 yeah could i just come in there just to say yeah. that i mean we had worked with the eti to develop an evaluation of pe in 2018 and have the terms of reference and everything but it was impacted by action short of strike and then covid i mean what we were going to be looking at is the nature and quality of pe provision the skills and confidence of teachers in delivery of the pe curriculum and identifying case studies of good practice and as i was mentioning in the opening remarks there once we start to get back to more normal routines and eti back to doing um uh, evaluative work we are going to prioritize this thematic um, evaluation of PE and I think that the other thing that we'll need to maybe look again at the terms of reference is what lessons we've learned from this period of COVID you know and, and how yeah, we can build some of that through absolutely um, and that's just to just to add to that down to what Karen said is that uh, we were absolutely delighted to be commissioned to undertake a study in physical education both myself and Dr Mark Barr and uh, we look forward to working with the department in actually carrying out the survey uh, in 2018, we had already issued letters to schools. We had a cohort of schools that we were going to sample. We were going to go in, spend the day in the view department, to talk about the quality, Chris, of physical education. Not so much the time, but the quality of the provision. And um, all that was ready to go. And then, unfortunately, we had action short of strike. And now we have the pandemic. But uh, we look forward, you know, in the future to working okay. with the EE and carrying out that. And I appreciate, Chris, the important, the important Sorry, timing. Ahead get yep. the timing right off for this because we have to let schools have the opportunity to get back to face-to-face -face learning uh, and more normal routines before we would attempt to evaluate the quality of PE provision you know it's it's about getting yeah. the timing off it right I understand that and, and, and to, to speak uh, uh, to what um, uh, Madeline had said as well I think it's it's time and quality uh, I don't think it's it, it's either or um, and but I mean uh, and this is this is in no way a criticism of individual schools or individual PE teachers. I fate would have it. I have a number of very close friends who are all PE teachers. Um, they are um, by and large doing starting work in extremely difficult circumstances. But alarm bells have been ringing for years with regards to departmental support for um, and, and monitoring of PE provision um, and. Indeed, the priority that is given to this aspect of the curriculum. Um, I, I am running out of time, unfortunately. So my final question is just that, obviously, the curriculum sports program, in that context of um, concerning levels of the provision, um, in terms of uh, the data that we have for the, the recommended two hours per week, um, the curriculum sports program was uh, providing um, exceptional support in that regard. It's my understanding that, as has been the case on far too many occasions, there, that the the uh, 
providers have yet to receive a letter of offer for financial year 2021-2022, which commences in a matter of uh, short weeks. Therefore, staff yet again, uh, some staff yet again are on protective notice. Can you provide us with an update with regards to funding for the curriculum sports program um, for the next financial year? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, the Minister most recently met with uh, the IFA and GAA on the 27th of January. Um, as you know, the Finance Minister has announced the budget for this year and it's been consulted on. Um, the Minister indicated to both providers that as things stand, the the budget which for this year was 500,000 will be available for next year. Uh, and we've already started our engagement with Eugene's team and Michael's teams uh, about uh, the work plan for, for next year. So that's ongoing. Thanks for that, Sam. Uh, that is helpful reassurance. When when will they receive a letter of offer? Whenever whenever, whenever I have the budget, um, what will actually happen is the you know, finance will decide the budget, it'll come to the department, the minister will make his decisions, and once those allocations are made, the letter of offer will go out. We're already working on that. Is there a time scale for that? We're not in no, a position to no. be able to give letters of offer until the budget is finalised yeah. and the, the minister makes his decision, final decisions on budget priorities. So we can't give a time scale un until that budget is actually finalised. Letters of offer can't issue in advance of the budget being confirmed and being available. That's just due process in terms of prudent financial management. We're aware that uh, IFA and GAA have written to us seeking assurances in regard to their staff and we are considering that issue and we'll provide advice to that on that issue to the minister in in you know the near future mm -hmm. does does the minister have a an indicative time scale for the budget from the minister for finance not that i'm aware and i was talking to finance this morning and no we're not aware of that yesterday i mean we know that 2020 one twenty two budget will be very challenging and unlikely to increase in real terms. And then the first thing is the minister, you know, will protect the school budgets and, and then determine what money is available for, for other yeah. providers and services. Yeah, the core services okay. of uh, schools, youth, early years obviously come first out of the budget. And then it's a matter of considering the wider budget position um, in terms of the range of external providers who provide curriculum support to our schools. Um, but as Sam said, the Minister has given a significant level of reassurance to both the IFA and GAA. And we are considering the issues around uh, the staff at this present time. OK, I could, I could go on, on this all day. I better bring my colleagues in. Thank you for your presentation and answers. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, Pat Shane, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to officials for your presentation. And uh, like the Chair, I'm very concerned about uh, the number of schools that are actually reaching the recommended two hours of PE per week. Uh, and, I mean, I think we have to do something to firm up those guidelines, in fact, to make them more than guidelines. And in my view, two hours probably isn't even enough a week. And I suppose uh, the education of our children and young people has three aspects. It's There's the educational and intellectual development of children. There's emotional and psychological development. And then uh, the physical development. And none of the, all of those aspects are interlinked. Uh, You've already outlined the educational benefits of physical activity, greater attention span, better short-term memory, and a, and a list of other things. And similarly, it also affects the emotional well-being of our children. Uh, so uh, none of those aspects is more important than, than the others. So, I mean, could you tell me what is the department doing to try and ensure that all schools deliver the minimum of two hours physical education? And have there been any discussions with SIA uh, about uh, them taking a more robust position on this issue? Thanks. I, th I, th I think, I mean, SIA do, just to touch on the SIA thing, SIA, SIA do produce a range of um, resources to support schools in um, delivering PE in the curriculum. And um, as I say, this is department recommendation and we are we want to see, you know, it, uh, the amount of provision increased in line with that recommendation. But I think 
the key for us is around the quality of provision and that I, th I think we have to look at what might be more effective rather than saying you need to do a certain amount of time, which we will work towards, is about ensuring the value of PE is recognised and reflected in whole school planning. Um, you know, we're coming from a, a good baseline in terms of quality, as, as Madeline has outlined. And if we want to increase time and ensure that provisions of high quality, well, then we'd really need to understand the nature of barriers, any barriers that there are, and the put in place actions to overcome them. And there's a, there's a lot of research around that, but what we need to have really is a full understanding of, as a, of our own situation, and that's as can relevant I, to I, school. Sorry, could I just interrupt you there? I apologise for cutting across you, uh, you and Phil. No. Yeah, and, and, and I understand this argument about the quality of physical education that's delivered, and, and that is vitally important. There's no doubt about that. But we never hear that argument about other subjects uh, as as a reason for them not being delivered. You know, uh, there is inconsistency across the delivery of English and maths and science uh, in, in our schools, but no one ever says, well, we can't uh, deliver those subjects because we can't deliver the uh, required quality. So, no, so I mean, I, I'm just flagging that point up uh, and... I mean, in, in my view, uh, I think physical education should be compulsory in schools uh, and the amount of time that uh, 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 is, is required should be mandatory as well. So, I mean, I, I'm also advocating in, in terms of, and I understand the difficulties there have been during the pandemic in delivering physical education, and I want to look beyond that with the reopening and uh, of, of schools and the return of children to schools uh, and the, the problems that we're going to face, particularly in terms of the emotional and psychological well-being of our children uh, and others that have fallen behind in their learning and so on. And physical education is going to play a massive role in all of that. And... I mean, I would like to, to flag up to yourselves as people of influence within the department about the need for a coordinated and integrated strategy uh, to deal with the reopening of schools and that it should be properly resourced and, and funded. Uh, and uh, there's going to be a need for, you know, obviously an educational input, of course, that's vital and education would take the lead. There's going to be a need for an input from the health department and from the community and voluntary sector. And importantly, because we're discussing about it, sporting organisations, the GAA, Ulster Rugby, IFA and, and so on. So, I mean, I, I would like you to start thinking in terms of a strategy for the recovery uh, of, of the health of our children. Uh, whether it be emotional or physical or educational, all of those issues have to, have to be dealt with. Thanks. No, yeah, think thanks, Pat. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Um, I'll, if I could bring another member, and we're just quite tight for time. Apologies for cutting across you there. Um, no can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And can I say thank you to each of the members uh, for attending today? And um, I, I don't have any uh, questions. Uh, Really, uh, I would continue the same sort of theme uh, in terms of uh, children's involvement. I do want to say this, though, and, and we, we, we make the demands and we make the demands of our schools. Um, but there are many other influences outside of the school that, that also need to be taken in, into uh, account. Uh, factors that the schools have no control of. Um, and indeed, we also put pressure on, on the schools and we expect uh, in terms of academic achievement to see, to see each year that, that the uh, academic subjects are, are, are well covered uh, and indeed uh, measurements of, of success. I don't know whether the members actually listened to the previous session uh, when we were uh, taking evidence, but it might be worth our while to, to have, have a listen in, into that previous session. 
But we do know, Chair, that children in Northern Ireland, um, in comparison with other parts of the UK, are least likely to take uh, physical, uh, engage in physical activity. Uh, and that is a mystery to me as to why that uh, should be so. But it is, it, it is a factor. In, uh, and, and we do know that the, the DOE guidance recommends that schools uh, should provide pupils with a minimum of two, two, two hours. And, and that has already been covered uh, by, by, by the previous speaker. Uh, I do, do perhaps want to just mention a, a little bit, Chair, around the curriculum sports programme and perhaps ask the question, uh, in terms of the supported delivery of the uh, cross-departmental strategies that, that include um, a fitter future for all. Um, and, and that's coming out, as I understand it, from the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And then Sport Matters, the uh, uh, strategy for sport and physical recreation delivered by communities. And those, those have been mentioned. Uh, and in terms of the academics area, and indeed the, the, the programs that education are working with and delivering uh, outside, uh, really coming from the department, a joined up strategy uh, for those uh, full areas. Could, could I just come in there to say that, just to let you know that Madeline is a representative for the department as our professional advisor. She's been engaged with other departments and she's been involved in that consultation with DFC in the co-design process for the development of their new uh, sport and physical activity strategy for Northern Ireland. I don't know if you want to say something. Yeah, yeah just um, the uh, sports matters. I mean, that, um, that the has guided policy uh, in Northern Ireland around physical education and sport. And there are the new cross-departmental. Uh, I think that's what's good. It's a co-design policy now and a strategy for physical education and sport from 2020 to 2030. And part of that engagement was uh, consulting with schools uh, and finding out what schools, where the barriers were for schools and what were the challenges for schools, but also what were the opportunities for schools. So I think that strategy, the fact that it's cross-departmental, will help to guide uh, policy in the future and to inform us of policy in the future. Can I just okay. ask sure. into that strategy? Yeah, okay. Uh, that, well, that's good. Can I just ask you, the, the, the team there mentioned barriers. Could you maybe just expand a bit more on what you mean by barriers? Yeah, uh, um, just a, a variety of, of challenges. Um, in terms of the, the two hours of PE, I suppose just to clarify, um, there's no statutory minimum time for any subject across the curriculum. And it's actually unusual, the department is actually unusually given a recommendation around PE in recognition of, of the importance of children getting re regular physical activity. There's actually a legislative bar on the department setting any time, uh, a statutory minimum time in the curriculum. So I mean, one of the barriers is it's a busy curriculum. It's finding time for PE within that. And the key to untapping that, as it is in so many areas of the curriculum, we would have similar discussions, for example, about modern languages, which have been in decline in, in recent years, is ensuring that it's valued by the school leadership, that it's prioritised by the school leadership, and that they, they see the importance of PE and that it has a prominent feature, PE and wider physical activity have a prominent feature right across the school curriculum, in the school development plan, and that there's regular monitoring and just that really went in the hearts and minds, um, as opposed to perhaps setting a statutory um, minimum amount of time, which we don't do for any other area of the curriculum. But the importance of, you know, increasingly society is recognising the importance of PE, and it's a matter of making sure that it is valued within schools. That's how we ensure, you know, both high quality delivery and that we work towards that two hours. We've also made it um, a condition of the sports program that um, schools will work towards providing the two hours of PE. So as a condition of you know participation in the program, they have to commit to working towards that. So clearly there, there are barriers there in terms of finding time within a busy curriculum and valuing PE. 
Madeline, if you want to yeah, add that. And, and the only other thing I would say in relation to that is um, the recommended time, the two hours recommended time is what we all want to see. Of course, we want to see as much physical education in our schools as possible. But also, just to come back, I think it was Pat who had actually mentioned about P being compulsory. P is a compulsory part of the Northern Ireland curriculum right through from P1 right through until uh, 16, you know. So there are compulsory elements of physical education that have to be delivered in our schools. And again, just to give credit to our teachers, I mean, they have done an amazing job in delivering broad and balanced PE programmes over the years. And there will be challenges as we move forward, without a doubt. But I think we're in a very good place and a very good uh, skills group of people who will be able to help and to deliver physical education in the future as well. Okay, need to move on, Robin. Thanks. Okay, I appreciate that. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, folks. Um, hey, guys, you do, are you um, passionate about sports and physical activity for young people? Absolutely, and um, absolutely, one hundred percent passionate about sport and physical education. I haven't taught for thirty odd years, you know myself, you know, and haven't been involved in coaching at international and local level, and haven't seen opportunities, wanting opportunities for young people because they're entitled to a quality PE program, they're entitled to an extracurricular program. Of course, we want to see them engaged. Uh, Justin, do you, do you love your jobs? Absolutely, one hundred percent. You feel um, like I mean, not, just, not just, you know, just in the Well, here, I'm, I'm probing here, guys. I'm probing. The reason I ask, the coaches here are delivering the sports program. There is no correct on the sports program anymore. It's now the sports program. Yeah. There's 26 coaches, 13 from the AFA and 13 from the GEA. They love their jobs, but they don't know they will have a job beyond March. So you can talk and give all the signs out for how important sport is in the curriculum, how important sport is for the minister. But those 16, those 26 coaches do not know beyond March that they will have a job delivering sports and physical education to our young people. Is that acceptable? What is the hold up? What is the hold up from the minister? What is the hold up from the Department of Finance? That is totally, totally unacceptable. So sound bites here this morning about how important sports is for young people. It doesn't, it doesn't ring through. I, th I mean, th we are aware of this issue, and what it, it arises because of the single-year budgets and the challenges that creates for us. You know, if we had a, a three-year uh, budget, we can commit to things on the longer term. There is just that challenge every year with the single budget position. Yeah. We understand it's a very difficult position for those coaches to be in, and understand on an individual level that that must be extremely difficult. Um, but we, we are engaging with IFA and GAA on the issue. Um, we hope to be able to put, put advice to the minister in the very near future in terms of um, providing some reassurances to those coaches. But all of this has to be taken in the context of an extremely challenging overall financial position for the Department of Education, whereby core services, early years, youth and schools they have to be prioritised first within that extremely tight budget. And then the range of other services from external providers you appreciate come in behind that. Those core services, uh, funding to schools on the front line have to be prioritised um, in the first. Okay, well here, my, my sense is that PE um, is just an awkward and inconvenient bolt on for the department and it's it's not acceptable. That, that's the feeling I get. You know, actions speak louder than words and you can give you can give all the the, the, the smooth and nice words. That's the reality of what's happening on the ground when, when you're 26 coaches who don't know they're going to have a job in the next month. And my strong belief is, as other members have, have mentioned already, that sports and physical education are as foundational and as important as English, as math, as science, yeah. and need to be delivered as such. And they, shan't, they can't be a sort of added extra into the curriculum because it's so important in developing young people physically, academically, mentally, emotionally, in terms of the mor their, their morals, in terms of their moral development, in terms of their leadership development, in terms of their ability and the capacity to work within a team. It's so, so important. I'm really, really passionate about this. I just feel that it's been not given the same um, focus that it should be. Could I just mention on that, I, I think that even during this pandemic, we, we would agree with that and that we have tried to keep that focus on physical activity during the time. I mean, the, our curriculum planning circular that went out was uh, very explicit in the importance of you know physical activity yeah. and engagement. We secured an exemption for PE in schools from the general health restrictions. Um, 
we provided update guidance on PE to schools, you know, even asking schools to allow kids to go in, in their PE kit so that we didn't have issues with changing in the schools. And, and another positive, I think, has been in that sports programme, you know, it's even even through this time that has continued to be delivered on an with online activity challenges and lessons and webinars and the evaluation of that pointed out that it was particularly welcomed by school leaders so i think we have tried to keep focus and we're very committed to as they return to school that will be in our guidance and that's true, that's true. i think it's I know, important I know, justin guys, to say I know all the metrics here i've heard the metrics and the metrics are really positive in terms of the delivery of that program and the impact of that program now that's been delivered to 200 out schools, only 200 out of 400, may I add. So there are a lot of schools who are not getting access to that program, which is worrying and a huge concern as well. But the impact of that program is massive. That's why it needs to have the support and, and the financial support that's needed to deliver it. And you've talked about being in existence for over 10 years. That is true and that is positive. And the, the curriculum sports program, which has been uh, superseded by the sports program, has was award winning, but it was reduced. So the sports program is now on offer is reduced from the, the previous curriculum sports program. So why are programs for delivery of sports to schools and delivery of PE to, to young people being reduced? That's not acceptable in my book. And on top of all this, we have major sports bodies now talking about the really adverse impact of the, the, the cessation of youth sports. And they're really worried about the impacts on that in terms of the mental and the physical health of young people. So these, these matters all need to address. I, I agree there needs to be a holistic approach. And how, how it cannot happen when sports programs in schools are being reduced and not enough emphasis has been put on that being delivered as part of the curriculum? Justin, I think it's really important to say that actually, and far from being um, marginal in the department's priorities, the department's actually spending more on external support for PE than it is on any other area of the curriculum. And I think that speaks volumes for our commitment to PE. The, the funding for the sports program is in excess of our curricular support for any other area of learning, including literacy and numeracy at this time. So we need to you know, be really clear on the huge level of investment that's being provided for external support. But also we need to be clear that external support is only one element of the PE curriculum. The, you know, the way um, to improve PE is to make it central to curriculum planning in schools and to you know look at how we support the capacity of our teachers external support is a fantastic program and it is also a fantastic program which has helped to upskill our teachers but we have to be realistic that it is one element of the delivery of pe in our schools and extracurricular support there's there's fantastic extracurricular programs that are delivered with teachers through the local community there's you know there's specialist pe teachers in post primary and we do have to be realistic this is one aspect but also to say that the level of investment is hugely significant and that in the context of a of a very difficult uh, and tight education budget that is continuing to be prioritized by the minister i think speaks volumes for the department's commitment to pe in the curriculum okay well, listen i don't doubt for a second your passion folks for the delivery of pe in the curriculum and I wish you well in terms of delivering that i do believe that it should be fundamental and foundational for education for young people at all levels the two hours must be the bare minimum that the children have access to physical education in schools because the the, the knock-on effects of involvement in PE are so widespread and it's, it, sh it should not be diminished in any sense and it should be more and more focused and more positively put on that. And I know that healthy kids are coming on board in this uh, committee afterwards and they have been helping in that regard too for the extracurricular piece, but it has to be curricular. It has to be curricular. You cannot farm out PE from schools. Thanks, Justin. And yeah. Very briefly, can I respond to that? Um, very, very briefly, and if I, if I could just, just advise uh, members and, and, and witnesses that if, if we don't keep our questions and answers concise, we'll not get to hear from healthy kids. Um, so um, I appreciate that. That's a no criticism, Justin. Really important points, really important questions. Thank you for, for raising them. And I'll let uh, Madeline respond there just for the final comment before I, I move on. Thanks. Very quick. I think the key thing is for physical education in Northern Ireland is that we have um, school, a school programme, a well-balanced quality physical edu education programme in our schools being delivered by our teachers and anything that can support and help that to increase children's physical activity levels we would welcome of course but the core is physical education is available to all children across the curriculum, across the key stages and there's a balanced curriculum there for them and that's where physical education is. And there are other things supplement that and support that. We're, we're, we're not disagreeing. Of course, we want that for our children. 
I, I think the I think I think the important point here is that the current the sports program isn't just supplementing; it's delivering the PE curriculum um, in a way that is potentially not otherwise being delivered. So I'm slightly concerned when I hear about the need to prioritize core services. The sports program is helping you to deliver core aspects of the curriculum that the data suggests is being inconsistently experienced by children and young people across schools in Northern Ireland. So I, I would just make that point and take my own advice and move on. <laughs> um, can I bring in uh, Robbie Butler, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I could probably listen to Justin. This is Justin. There's no doubt that this is Justin's topic, and we've been waiting this a long time. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about it, as are all the the members. I would come at it from a, a, a more mental health perspective. I wouldn't have played sports to the level that Justin did. Um, very often, the child who in PE didn't really enjoy PE because he wasn't the fastest. He was never going to get picked for the team, uh, and and all of those things that maybe in, in, a, in a less uh, uh, well being focused curriculum um, singled some children out to maybe not enjoy PE. So, could you tell us today, with regard to the provision of PE, and what that might uh, be like to look at all of the children, not just those who are, are good in terms of some sporting prowess, particularly in and around primary school? What what that might look like? What schools are being um, guided towards to make PE um, uh, available for all and attractive to all pupils, um, regardless of their abilities? Disabilities um, and maybe additional needs, please. Are you okay? Yes, yes. yes. Um, we have a, a curriculum uh, program uh, across the key stages. So we have uh, a balanced program where children are offered opportunities to engage in not just games, because a lot of focus has been around games here, but also in gymnastics and dance and athletic activities. And also, we have a very strong fundamental movements uh, skills program operating in our uh, key stage one classes, you know, P1 and P2, and that's basically trying to uh, give the foundations for movement and to support movement and physical development, so that whenever children progress through the school, then those skills, those fundamental movement skills, can then they can be challenged in a different environment. Um, inclusive, 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 being inclusive is a very key thing in physical education. We want all our young people in our schools to be included, and I mean there are programs, there there are. Teachers will adapt and they will differentiate within the physical education program to meet the needs of the children. So, does that help to answer the question? Yeah, it, it certainly does to an extent. Except that I would, you know, going back to what all of the other members are pointing towards, and I'm not sure who it was that talked about the amount of spend that is given towards this that would be it would be greater than most of the other curriculum um, uh, ideas. But yet, in all the uptick is very, very poor. And I know that it is down to the schools individually to determine that. Um, given the fact that we know what the poor outcomes for in terms of lack of uh, physical activity um, and all of the things associated, associated with that, like, for instance, obesity um, and, and uh, maybe that lack of uh, social, social uh, interactivity, what would you say are the um, sort of the... the uh, obviously, there's outcomes, there's good outcomes. What are the bad outcomes from not addressing this appropriately and seeing that all pupils do, in fact, um, have a, a, a high level of physical activity? Now, and the piece that I'm particularly interested in is the outdoor activities as well, because, as I've said, I'm incredibly keen to ensure that this is tied into the emotional and mental well-being of young people too, given that we have an inclement weather in this country. How outside the box are we thinking with regard to, 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 to mobilising this on, a, on, a, on, a, on the scale that it should be? I, th I think, Robbie, um, it's important to think of ways. You're quite right. There's some children who are harder to reach and who may not enjoy PE. We know from the evidence base that, you know, um, that that might be particular groups of children, maybe children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, maybe children with SEN. And, and it, you know, they, they find uh, PE harder to engage with. And the most important thing is for schools to design a programme that is inclusive but also perhaps with older children, for example, uh, teenage girls are sometimes referred to as a group who are maybe hard to engage around PE, that those children might have a role in the design of the programme and that they, 
you know, they select activities in the PE program that they're interested in, that meets their needs, and that they might be more willing to participate in than the traditional games that Madeline talked about. So it really is about, that's why the flexibility in our curriculum is vital. There's not a heavy degree of prescription. There's a balanced program of athletics, games, dancing, but by the time you get to key stage four, it really is. It's still a statutory requirement. Schools must deliver it to young people, but there's considerable flexibility to allow that amount of design and engagement with young people, really to try to ensure the very thing that you're saying, that it's not just those who are fantastic sportsmen and women who participate. Um, you know, the difference between PE and extracurricular sports is that all our children as a statutory minimum participate in physical education and in that sense it has to be inclusive. Okay, um just a final point then, Chair, if that's okay. Sorry. Just, yeah, just, thanks, to put, just to put just non on note, I wasn't I wasn't great at, at, at running in football, but if I had a play GEA in my school I know it'd have been better than Justin. Um so that last, this is the last point Chair, right? Um uh, with regard to so we, we can say what we think, teachers can say what they think. What are, the, what are children saying? What has been done to uh, get the voice of the children to make sure that we are actually creating and delivering something um, that they actually want and will respond to? Um, one of the surveys that is carried out is a young people's behaviour and attitude survey. And I know that through DFC, they put quite a wide range of questions on there. And this is a survey of uh, post-primary, so year eight to year 12. And there are it's a really interesting section, you know, to look at. I'd be happy to forward it to the um, committee. Um, a range of questions about enjoyment of sport, and you do see these trends coming up. But also, they ask what kind of things are, are the barriers that are preventing the kids from getting involved in these these issues. And there's quite interesting breakdowns then that you can do, you know, by say by gender or other characteristics of what will engage them in there. So yeah, the, the children. That's one way I know that um, the to, uh, young people's voice is heard in, in this debate and informing the strategies that are being put in place. And I'm sure when there's inspection, Madeline, you, you'd take the views yeah. of... Um, certainly on inspection, I mean, uh, we, would, we would speak to young people as part of the inspection process. And schools have really worked hard to get the young person's voice in, included in school through a number of ways. The school council, the school prefix, um, there's a, a very good programme that's in operation, actually in the Armagh, I'm from Armagh myself, but the Armagh, Van Bridge and Craig Avon area. And that's the Girls Active programme where the young teenage girls are actually co-designing the physical education programme with their physical education teacher. And that then allows them to have a, a programme that meets their needs and interests as well. Uh, I was just going to mention, um, Robbie, there's a specific resource that SIA have produced called Every Sport for Everyone. And that is really specifically designed to look at how schools can provide uh, inclusive sessions, particularly for children with SEN and a mixed ability. And it's really designed to make sure that PE is inclusive as possible. And it's a really useful resource that is there and is available to schools. Okay. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Um, Madeline, very brief comment. Uh, I, I must admit, it, 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 the ABC um, Girls Active sounds super super program why in the world is that cited as unique practice what like why in 2021 is engaging girls in co-design of what pe um is attractive for them uh, a standout program i think um uh, it's not so much that it's a standout program but i think uh, it's actually a program and i've had the privilege of going and listening and speaking to some of the teachers and some of the girls involved where you're actually getting the young person's voice in the, in the design of the curriculum they're uh, being asked to be ambassadors for physical education in their schools and to increase participation levels by encouraging them to bring a friend to an activity or whatever Rob, um, Chris, i think that's what i'm saying extremely um, extremely positive just just yes. Concerning that that is not the norm, um, and and that's what we're working towards. Uh, can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. So good afternoon now. Thank you very much for your time today and your uh, answers so far. Um, I want to just thank the department for its commitment uh, uh, to sport and and recreation, our schools, and and the resource that's been provided. It's it's hugely. Uh, welcome and, and much needed, as other members have said. 
Um, I suppose I fully understand, as Chair of the Public Accounts Committee, the pressures that you're under in terms of uh, single year budgets. That is hugely problematic. Uh, it is hugely problematic and very, very traumatic for the coaches that are involved because obviously they get a year's funding and then they're worrying whether they're going to be uh, in employment the following year instead of getting a three year commitment or whatever. That's that's something which is wide across the community sector and something which is um, debilitating for, for employees because it, it means that if that uncertainty is there, they begin to look for other employment, which may not necessarily, given the current circumstances that prevail out there, be uh, there at the moment. And so I fully understand the, the, the issue there. Have we got a, a, an indication from your minister as to the, the answers from, um, for example, the finance minister around these monies of a time scale at all? No, I'm, I was talking this morning to our finance people and there there is not nothing at the moment because I was asking, you know, how certain we were um, that still, you know, is still being uh, consulted on as far as I'm aware. Uh, but as I say, the minister is very supportive of this programme and, you know, and he has met with the with the GAA and IFA on, on a number of occasions. To discuss it. Yeah. Just, if I can just come in there as well. I mean, my understanding is that the consultation on the budget for 2021-22 finishes on the 26th of February. Um, so until that process has gone been gone through um, and the evidence collated, then we're not going to be in a position to know our budget uh, until the finance minister makes his decision, which I accept passes on difficulties for the organisations and it, it's an issue we face every year with them, um, and we have to work it through with them. Um, and as I said earlier, in response to Chris, we're, we're already in that process of planning for next year. So how many coaches are we talking about in total? 26. 26 coaches, 13 from each organisation. Well, that can't be 13 from each organisation because there seem, doesn't seem to be anybody from rugby. Why is that? No, um, when I say each organisation, I'm talking about the IFA and GAA. Ulster rugby yeah. aren't currently represented. Why is that? Well, it was a ministerial no, no. decision in 2012. The then Education Minister decided to commission the IFA and GAA as regional bodies to deliver the programme in schools and work with which, them to code Which minister was that? That was, minister Katrina Rian, that was Katrina yeah. Rian, and then it's been continued. The programme's been continued by successive ministers. Yeah. Um, I, I went to a school where we had to play rugby and fortunately only had to play it for one year and then you could opt out. Uh, as someone who didn't excel in rugby, rugby, I was happy with that. But look, there are many of our schools who do play rugby and rugby is a very significant support in our community. Uh, so, I mean, a number of a number of members have talked about GAA and IFA and, and Ulster Rugby. But here we have a situation where actually we're not talking about Ulster Rugby because Ulster Rugby is not included. And I think that that's something that's need to be looked at because rugby is played by a significant significant number of young people in our schools, uh, and should not be left out. I would I simply make that William, point. Sorry, I'm sorry. Just I think just from the the previous presentation that IFA, GAA, and also rugby gave, um, also rugby aren't included in the sports program. That's just IFA and GAA, but they are in schools. Yeah, when well, you that, I mean, I, I served, I served in the decal committee, and the three, the, these three sports would have come in and made presentations, but you've just said they're not included in the sports program. Yeah, but yes, it's also yes. just to be clear, the sports program isn't IFA and GAA delivering Gaelic and soccer. Yeah. They're delivering and supporting the delivery of PE. Originally, the program was about fundamental movement, and now it's about providing a range mm. of support across the PE curriculum. It's not a program that delivers football and Gaelic. It's a program that is supporting the delivery right across the PE curriculum, just sort of to be clear on that. Yeah, but, but, but nevertheless, there are thousands of young people in our schools play rugby. Rugby should not be excluded, and I think the department needs to look at that. I have no, I have no um, I have a particular axe grind. I have no involvement in any rugby clubs or, or anything like that, um, and, and we haven't even got to speak about cricket, which isn't included either. And I think cricket is also a, a sport which is played by a significant number of schools. And I do declare an interest as a vice president of Woodville Cricket Club. Um, cricket is another sport to be included, and I would want that raised. And I will raise those, both those issues with the minister because 
those are sports that are played at a significant level of young people uh, in our in our schools and our communities and we can't have a sports program that basically is two sports and other sports not included thanks okay. thanks william uh, nicola brogan mla thanks Chair, and thanks to everyone for um, attending here this morning. Much of what I want to discuss has actually been discussed already, so I'll be very brief. Um, I'd just like to reiterate whatever everyone else has said, you know, that maybe we're concerned about um, the fact that there's such a little take up, like most people aren't getting their two hours um, recommended access to PE within schools. So, I really do urge the Minister to put in an ambitious and proper bid um, to ensure that this programme gets its proper funding in the future. Um, the other topic I want to touch on was. Um, about the participation of females. Now, I know we've mentioned a few different programmes there, one um, in Armagh and um, also just basic inclusivity, you know, across the board, not just with females. So with like maybe different children's abilities and children's special educational needs and how uh, we include them in it. But can you give me, can you can we just expand on how you plan to bring more girls on board um, with the sports programme, please? Well, the sports programmes delivered to all boys and girls um, at Key Stage 2. So it's an inclusive programme. It's not you know, aimed at any particular groups and it's, it's school classes do it during the school day. Um, I don't know if that answers your question about the sports programme in particular. There's, there's, an, there's probably a wider issue and maybe Madeline want to comment ab ab about that a bit more around the, the uptake of particularly young teenage girls in terms of wider sports. But in terms of the sports programme, just to be really clear, it's an inclusive programme that's delivered during uh the, you know during the school day and is inclusive of both boys and girls um you know in all our primary schools so there's no issue in terms of that there's no issue in terms of uptake of PE. PE is a statutory requirement when we're talking about um female participation we're talking about in sports more widely and we're also talking about how we make PE during the school day as enjoyable and as engaging as possible for all our young people don't know Madeline if you want to well, can I just come in there? Was it, is it not the case that um, the department wanted to kind of reinvigorate the programme to make it more inclusive for um, females in particular? It wasn't to make it more inclusive. It was just to look at specific ways in which it could encourage, not in the programme, but girls to be more active generally. So it wasn't, okay. it wasn't about participation in the programme. You know, the programme's always been inclusive in that way. It was just looking at was there ways as part of the lessons that they could really encourage and uh, set an example for the longer term participation of uh, girls in sports and activities. Does and that make sense? Which is important, Jess, and uh, that's a positive move. So I appreciate that. Uh, Madeline, if you'd like to go ahead, I would, I would appreciate any update you have on like um, on f females participating more, please. I think uh, the, the key thing is within our schools, uh, our, our PE uh, departments and our staff are talking to the young people in schools in relation to the physical education programme. The key thing is that when we come to key stage four, uh, which is year 11, year 12, fourth year and fifth year in old money, um, those, the programme there is specifically states that they should be given opportunities to not just participate in, but also to plan and design the programme. So I think our, our schools have been working very hard with uh, those young girls and uh, to try and increase female participation. There's also, and I think um, I think it is very important that uh, it's, there are so many sports clubs and organisations out there who are actually working with our schools, um, netball, basketball, rugby, and uh, there has been a specific drive, you know, in relation to trying to increase female participation. So a lot of the sports development officers in the city council areas and the district council areas would be working specifically at targeting those young girls uh, to try and increase female participation. As I could just come in there too, Nicola. Um, yeah. In relation to the sports programme, it's been externally evaluated at the moment, um, and they've been talking to kids and girls in particular. And one of the questions they asked said, what does leading a healthy and active life mean to you? And when they did the baseline, um, which was September of last year, over 90% of females at Key Stage 2 said associated that with losing weight or being skinny, which is very negative. And I think this was issue, or this issue was raised at, at the previous presentation by the IFNGAA. 10 weeks into the programme, that had fallen to just over 10%. 
So, and, and, and the feedback we're getting from teachers on behalf of children is that girls are now becoming more more involved in PE and, and more enthused. Well, that's really good, actually, and it just shows that the education part of it um, that's so important within the sports to, to ensure to teach girls that it's not about being skinny or how they look, it's about being healthy and that. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for um, the contributions there. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nick. A really important question. Thank you. Um, uh, can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, a lot of the questions that I had written down here have already been answered, but uh, a bit like you, uh, uh, yourself, Chair, and Justin, I'm passionate about team sports and physical activity and exercise through school. 60% uh, of schools falling short of at least two hours PE is not a good read. But as I'm sure, Chair, I've, I've mentioned it before uh, in this committee that I believe schools should be encouraged to foster uh, links with local sporting clubs, not just for theme-based sports like football and GAA, or, or as William has alluded to there recently, rugby and cricket. Uh, but I think also to provide physically challenging and innovative activities generally. Uh, it's not all about the main team sports uh, in Northern Ireland, GAA and football, but also about athletics, dance, games, gymnastics, rowing where possible. I mean, my own town's a big rowing. Uh, I'm sure, you, as you know, we have four representatives at the Olympics. All promote confidence, resilience, break down barriers and foster friendship. But uh, there's just one concern that I have, and that is a concern that was raised there today, that football and GAA coaches are also delivering other aspects of PE. I find that strange because both organisations have stringent coaching tests and badges at all levels, specifically designed around their particular sport, not general physical activity. I would like to see the PE department provide it uh, through a proper structured curriculum timetable. That there's a period set aside every week, every day for, for different classes to do physical education. And it shouldn't be that we have to buy in coaches from Gaelic or football to deliver a PE curriculum when it's not their email. I, I really find that strange, Chair. I, I think it is very important to say that teachers deliver the curriculum uh, in primary schools. Those coaches are only there to support teachers. They are not responsible for the delivery of the PE curriculum in our primary schools. That always remains with the class teacher and the school leadership. And it is a, it's a support. And it's also a support uh, to both the young people and to the teachers. But the department is very clear. This is not about coaches taking responsibility or delivering the PE curriculum. That's completely not our position. This is about, in the best practice, schools should be looking at how this support can extend and improve their PE provision for um, the children in the school. It's not about this is the PE provision for the children in the school. It's very much about an extension. As any, as you know, as any partnership with a community um, or voluntary or sporting organisation should be, it's an extension. But the core of the PE curriculum in our primary schools is delivered by the class teacher. Yeah, thanks for cl cl clarifying that up for me because it didn't come across that way. So if I picked it up wrong, apologies. If I didn't pick it up wrong, well, we'll just have to run with it. But it is, uh, it's important that schools start to foster relationships with local clubs, local football clubs, sports clubs, whatever, uh, because it benefits both, benefits the school and it benefits the club. Uh, and and it's normally delivered by volunteers, not paid coaches. Yes, and I think you see that in such yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything you've said, Morris. Um, um, it's very much physical, physical education our schools delivered by teachers and our post primary schools by specialist physical education teachers. So I agree with that. Uh, whenever we are out in schools, that is what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, in post-primary the phys physical education program being delivered by teachers and specialists. And uh, in best practice, what we see is where physical education uh, uh, is on the school development plan, and then it's prioritised. And then senior leadership give value and priority to that. And then what happens then is you have a whole school approach to physical education. You've got a good plan, progressive program, right through from P1, P7, from year eight right through to year 12. 
So that's 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 what we that's what happens in our schools. That's what we're seeing in our schools. That's what our PE teachers are delivering. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much for that, and thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Morris, can I can I? Uh, there, there are clearly there are clearly issues here. Um, so we can't we can't give an answer away for all of them. Um, what what time is given to physical education training of uh, initial teacher training for primary school teachers? Um, I think again, Madeline, you were involved in um, yes. some kind of review. Um, it depends on what, what 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 you're talking about here. If you're talking about the uh, honours degree program, is that what you're asking, Chris, in relation to? Well, you, you, to, to, to clarify, um, you've said that primary school teachers deliver physical education curriculum in primary schools. What yes. what level of, of training during initial teacher training do they receive to equip them to do that? Okay, in the BA and honours degree in both St Mary's and Stranmillis, um, you can specialise in physical education as a core area and that can be carried through throughout the four years. And so you will have specialist people coming out into the system who are, physical education would be their, their main subject. Uh, for all of the other, um, have I lost? Have we lost? We lost everybody? Have we lost everybody? Have we? Can you hear us still or? Hi, I can. <laughs> um, we lost everybody. We lost everyone. <laughs> in the, in the Is that me back? There's a chair back. back. Yeah, back. Okay, sorry, that's me back. Can you um, hear me okay? Yeah. I think, I think we hear other little I think we okay. lost everybody else. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll run with that then. So, so are, are, are you saying that a, a primary school teacher um, only receives preparation for the physical education curriculum if they choose it as a specialism, or, or will they? No. No. no? Okay. You were cut off at that stage. Okay. Sorry. So, um, yeah. Every every student going through the BA honours degree will have curriculum studies in physical education, as they will have in art and in music and in. Uh, literacy and numeracy and, and all the rest of it. So everybody coming through the colleges will have covered physical And is that and is it is it a, a proportionate amount of time? Is it the same amount of time as all those other um, disciplines? Uh, on the we have just uh, completed the inspection of the BA honours degree in both colleges, and one of our uh, recommendations and findings was to look at the um, balance between physical education and other areas of the curriculum, in particular literacy and numeracy. Chris, that's what we would recommend. And is that recommendation based on a concern that there is inadequate time at this moment in time? No, not that there's inadequate time, but because there has been such a focus on literacy and numeracy, as you all know as well, you know, in our primary schools, and uh, just to ensure that physical education is in there as well with them. Okay. And what CPD does a primary school teacher get in relation to physical education? Well, this is this is the the key question. You know, we have. Uh, uh, a lack of CPD across the board, you know, budgets have been cut. Um, we used to have physical education uh, specialist people within the Education Authority who have dealt with physical education issues. That is no longer the case. Um, so really uh, looking at um, continuing professional development, uh, schools uh, will look at their school development plan. Schools will look and senior leadership within the school will look at the needs of uh, staff within their schools. And then uh, the school development plans go through to the education authority, and the education authority then that will hopefully inform what developmental needs are required. And it's very much within the schools now, particularly in relation to the the, 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 the professional learning strategy, that we're really looking within. We're looking within to see if we have the specialism, and if they don't have the specialism within, looking without within clusters within the area learning communities to continue that professional development as well. But okay. there is, there is uh, I agree, there is a concern around continuing professional development in the round, Chris, not just in relation to physical education. Okay. Time has beaten us. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, I think that ETI review is long overdue and wish you well with it. And you can sense from the, the, the passion and the interest from members in relation to physical education that will remain in contact with you about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, members can ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back to the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise actions uh, from that briefing. Yes, um, so the, the, the committee was um, concerned about a few things, so I suggest that a letter would go to the department on this. Um, the two hour week data, um, I'm particularly concerned about the data for um, the, the uh, Number of students, a number of pupils who were having more than two hours, it's really low and historically low. Um, the uh, committee might also want to seek urgent confirmation of funding of the sports program and ask the department to reassure the coaches that their job will be funded in the coming year. Um, and uh, the committee might want to ask uh, why the sports program is such a reduced version of the curriculum sports program and is only rolled out to 50% of schools. Um, uh, the committee was concerned about uh, how much girls are involved routinely in co-creating um, the content of their PE classes. Uh, they did get a bit of reassurance about that, but um, it might be worth following it up. Um, the committee wanted to review inclusion of Ulster Rugby um, within the sports programme. Um, and that the department should make an ambitious and proper bid that this area will get adequate funding in the future. And it was the view of the committee that the ETI review um, of physical education is long overdue. Is there anything else, members, to, that you would want to have included in that letter? Anything else, members? Can I suggest w cricket as well, Chair, please? Okay, what, William, what, what do you mean by that? Did you take, did you take the, the point from the officials that, that this is uh, IFA and GFA are, are delivering the programs, but they are delivering fundamental movements, um, not necessarily the sport per se. So would you, would, would, you, would you want to engage with cricket to see that they have the capacity to deliver physical well, education curriculum? Is it, or or, or what, what, what precisely is your, the nature of the proposal? Thanks. Well, well the, nature, the nature of the proposal is that um, you know, you have some cricket clubs in Northern Ireland that that, that are semi-professional, uh, who employ professionals that, that come in from overseas, like South Africa, or whatever. Um, you can see a significant number of young people who play cricket, and uh, people will argue cricket is a seasonal sport. All sports are seasonal, um, and so I just think that, that I'm not suggesting that cricket should get the same resource as uh, the football or or Gaelic sports. But I, I am suggesting that cricket should not be excluded because there's a significant number of people who play it. Um, and, and I do think that the department should at least be looking at it. Um, but the, in terms of rugby, there's no, absolutely no question that rugby should be included, given the number of schools and the thousands of young people who play it. Sorry, I think there's a misunderstanding here in terms of what the programme actually is. The programme is not delivering GEA coaching or soccer coaching in the schools. It's delivering fundamental movement skills and active activity, physical education in the schools, not, not the sports delivering their coaching. Their, their, their yeah. yeah, but look, the, the, the reality is um, I fully understand what the programme is, as I fully understand the budget um, pressures. But what I'm saying is that you cannot have a situation where where sports are, are you know, young, hundreds, thousands of young people playing sports, and those sports are not included. It needs to be more inclusive. It's not inclusive. Okay, I'm not. I'm not. In, There's no sport in, 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 No, I, I, I don't understand either, from Alice William. But is there a form of words that you'd like to include in the correspondence? No, I'm happy for the clerk to put something together. Okay, and William, is it inclusion in the sports program itself, or greater? Um, representation of rugby and cricket in the curriculum yeah i think i i think i think to be honest for me but it's only me it would be both of those things right As i'll come up with a formal word then okay any any other members one quick one sure. here sure. Um, uh, jo justin and then robin thanks justin sorry um just the uh, i think we do need to celebrate success and the abc active girls program is phenomenal as alluded to by a number of members already <clears throat> we write to them and congratulate them on their success and being leaders and being innovators and leading the way in a very important uh, realm which is about getting and, and promoting a uh, activity within girls We'll be, uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be glad to do that. Yes, we're we'll glad to do that. Thanks, Justin. Robin? Uh, Chair, you, you might cover this under another item, but obviously I have raised previously in the committee about the continuing professional development opportunities. 
uh, and that would be a concern of mine uh, as well. So uh, the committee clerk may, maybe it's a different literature, uh, but indeed I think I'd need to raise the issue of CPD. Um, I think it's important in the uh, overall contact with our educational system. Yeah, uh, can I, happy to do that. Can I raise another one, Chair? Um, uh, we are made aware within the research document that children in Northern Ireland are least likely to meet the required levels of physical activity when compared across the UK. And if, if that if that is primary to um, our, our children, then the likelihood of them going into physical education uh, continues to, to, to reduce. So many could we raise the question with the Minister for Health and that, uh, on the question of uh, children uh, and what the implications uh, for that actually are? Yeah, happy to, happy to write to the, the Health Committee and or the Minister of Health to ask for their assessment of uh, the uh, physical activity of children in Northern Ireland and what, yeah. what implications that would have for participation in physical education. Yeah. 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 And, and also then a letter with regards to an update on uh, CPD opportunity for teachers in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. And on that topic of physical activity for children, our agenda item seven is uh, our Healthy Kids Oral Briefing. Members content to move to that? Yep. Okay, thank you. If I could ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add our witnesses, uh, refer members to the briefing note from the committee clerk at page 260 and briefing papers from the Healthy Kids organisation at page 262. Uh, can I welcome Kevin McCreary, or sorry, Kevin Creary, Healthy Kids, Paul Carville, Healthy Kids, Chris Cousins, Healthy Kids, and Brendan McConaughey, the organisation and Development and Change Manager at Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give you 10 minutes to make your opening statement followed by questions from members. And can I give you a very warm welcome uh, to the Education Committee today. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Rob. Good and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our Healthy Kids program. And also thank you for placing health and well-being on your agenda today. It's a subject very close to our hearts. My name is Kevin Creary, and I am a primary school teacher and a PE coordinator at Tonicmore Primary School in Lurgan. The Healthy Kids program was started in my school in September 2014, the 86 pupils and it's now been delivered in over 150 schools in Northern Ireland. Healthy Kids is a community interest company and a social enterprise. It is a holistic health program for schools that delivers physical activity, emotional well-being, nutritional guidance, and uses cutting edge technology for every child. It is non-sport specific and every child takes part at their own level. We have a plan, a program, and a vision for each child in every primary school in Northern Ireland to help every child achieve their best possible state of well-being. And we want to give health the same importance as numeracy and literacy on the national curriculum. Our digital content is a fantastic support for teachers pre, during and after COVID-19. And it is a one-stop holistic program that improves the health of every child. I would like to hand over to my colleague, Paul, to give some details on the program. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Carvel, and I am a director in the organisation uh, managing the programme on a day-to-day -day basis full-time. This section of the presentation will focus on how healthy kids would provide a structured physical education and overall physical activity programme that every child of preschool age to primary seven has the opportunity to participate in. From the outset, one of our key principles and targets is to encourage 60 minutes activity every day. Research carried out by leading universities show the connection between improved health and well-being and educational attainment. That's why this resource should be embedded in primary schools from nursery. All PE plans, which are curriculum linked, differentiated into each year group, with emphasis on teaching and engaging every child, will sit on the teacher dashboard 
current portal and allocated to each child through their app to follow up at home on what has been done in school. The short videos, approximately four minutes on supporting PDF plans, cover every topic for all ages. These are developed in con conjunction with Dr. Elaine McLaughlin from St Mary's University College Belfast and Stromilis lecturers Brandon McKay Redmond and Barbara McConnell. These resources will exist to enhance the skill set and confidence of teachers, giving clear direction on how to effectively deliver a year long PE program for their class. It creates a springboard for further development. After school model, as part of our model, we encourage every student to embrace a strong after school model whereby all ages are able to experience the sports most suited to their school and community. As well as giving a clear path beyond the school day, there is the potential to generate finance that can contribute to the sustainability of what can be a program. Sorry, bear with me. Of huge impact. Healthy kids have generated close to one million pounds across six years in after school clubs alone. We will work with the coaches of all sports and councils to provide this for our schools. If we could just hand over Chris Cousins at this stage, please. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Chris Cousins and I'm a lecturer in Sport and Exercise Science and Technical Advisor to Healthy Kids. Uh, within our groundbreaking technology, there is a capability for teachers to interact, edit and record on their dashboard every activity that is completed by their class, with the function in place to produce a report on each child at the click of a button. This applies not only to the physical activities being done, but also nutritional information and well-being, as my colleagues will allude to. This slide shows the report that every child receives. This is live and can be printed off at any time, daily, monthly, termly or annually. Using the latest international normative data and our own data collection, we have pioneered the creation of a standing model for cardiovascular fitness, allowing us to compare pupils to other pupils in their class, school, county, country, and to the international norms. Interventions can then be put in place for children who score below average, focusing on improving cardiovascular fitness and health. Through the application of the outcome-based accountability approach, we are committed to assessing our impact through how, how much activity we have done, how well we have done it, and most importantly, is anyone better off as a result? As you are well aware, the Daily Mile is a government-backed initiative aimed at improving the physical, emotional and mental health of children. While following the 10 core principles to make it su successful and sustainable at schools, Healthy Kids have taken the Daily Mile to the next level with our own new initiatives. The Daily Journey for Foundation and Key Stage 1 and the Athletic Challenge for Key Stage 2. Both initiatives engage, incentivize, reward and report on each child throughout the year. We have created numerous incentives to get children out running, jogging or walking and provide a simple but effective way of ensuring all children can take part in critical physical activity while also covering key components of the curriculum. Furthermore, we want to help primary and pre-primary age groups learn about how to look after their physical bodies too, focusing on nutrition, eyes, ears and teeth. Nutritional, nutritional materials in this section are provided by the Queen's University Belfast Centre for Public Health in line with Northern Ireland curriculum and key stages. Video, lesson plans and follow-up worksheets form the means of delivery. Working with Danielle O'Neill, Senior Lecturer and her team, who ran the Project DER pilots, our aim is to improve children's health and quality of life, well-being, food knowledge and dietary habits from an early age. Modifying the food environment in primary schools was found to have a positive effect on children's behaviour, knowledge about food and where it comes from and dietary intake. A multi-stakeholder approach, teaching children about good health is critical. The range of engaging activities will help children understand the importance of building sustainable, healthy habits. My name is Brendan McConaughey. I'm a chartered physiotherapist. And to be clear, I'm not here today representing the Belfast Trust, but instead my, my after hours hobby um, and indeed my passion, which is uh, population health and wellbeing. I've been helping healthy kids now for a number of years in the development of their programme. The rising rates of emotional well-being issues among school-aged children has been well evidenced in the literature and for healthy kids this was reflected as more and more principals and teachers were, were, were coming to us and were asking about emotional support for their pupils. The emotional well-being content that we went on to create was built in conjunction with a consultant clinical psychologist with vast experience in the field of child mental health and trauma. 
The topics that we have chosen to include have been informed by research into child emotional well-being and covers such fields and issues as assertiveness, self-esteem and impulse control. As well as facilitating children to learn about these, these key issues, these key topics, we offer the opportunity for gratitude journaling, an evidence-based opportunity for children to focus on the positives within their life, um, as well as some age-appropriate mindfulness videos to help calm anxious or overactive minds whilst at school or at home. There are clear concerns about society, throughout society about the negative impact that COVID-19 is having on our young people. A King's Fund paper on what healthcare can, can learn from other disasters published just this month, February 21, highlights the need for scalable and spreadable low intensity interventions delivered outside of formal healthcare settings as a preventative measure. And I believe that the emotional well-being component of the Healthy Kids program will enable schools to mitigate against these concerns um, by offering evidence-based support to teachers and to children. We apply a trauma-informed lens to the well-being content we offer, and we are exploring both embedding adverse childhood experience and trauma awareness training in our teacher dashboard, as well as using our network of Healthy Kids coaches to deliver in-school trauma-informed practice sessions as part of the train-the-trainer approach by the Safeguarding Board NI. As previously alluded to, the Healthy Kids Virtual Buddy app and Teacher Staff Board currently work together to provide live and end of year reports. Teachers have the ability to record their activities in class and this recording mechanism adds minutes to each pupil's app to help them achieve their 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity each day. This in turn adds to the pupil, class and school report to show how much activity has been undertaken. The Healthy Kids Virtual Buddy app allows pupils to record their own activity while at home with teachers having the functionality to message their pupils with tasks and challenges for the week ahead. All activities are rewarded with coins, allowing pupils to purchase and customize their in-app avatar. Teachers can select a mover of the week as an added incentive to motivate their pupils to do more. All activities are added to their respective end of year report. This, however, is just the beginning. We've recently secured £129,000 through the Connective Health Innovation Centre in conjunction with Ulster University and Healthcare Analytics. This adds to the previous funding of Innovate UK, bringing our total funding towards our technology to over half a million pounds. We are currently developing a new integrated framework within our dashboard and app, allowing principals, teachers and parents to view steps, sleep and sit entry time of each pupil. Additionally, based on this data synced from a wearable or from Google or health, health through a device, will allow for individual interventions to be implemented for each and every child. The data gathered available for analytics will allow us to create long-term interventions for each school, evaluating areas for improvement and highlighting pupils that may need additional help, all through the Healthy Kids dashboard. We'll make teachers' lives easier by reducing the workload and having an evidence-based approach to what goes on inside and outside of the classroom. Driving every facet of our holistic approach will be an interactive, automated calendar, supplying teacher, parent, and most importantly, every child with activities, targets, and resources to follow both during the school day until they go to bed at night. Healthy Kids, along with the aforementioned stakeholders and the Department of Education, can help put every child's health or every people's health and well-being at the forefront of principals, teachers and parents' focus. Achieving our vision of an early intervention solution to create healthy children has only been possible through development and delivery with and by our key stakeholders. As you can see on the slide, we have been engaging with parents, teachers, principals, board of governors, sports clubs, private business, research organisations and indeed students. And this has been instrumental in our growth to date. Schools have now written healthy kids into their school development plans, inculcating key aspects of the national curriculum such as PDMU and PE. Artificial intelligence based ed tech solutions have been shown to increase productivity and reduce cost within educational settings. It is simple for teachers to use as a record, reward and report course, similar to mathematics and accelerated reader. This program will allow greater collaboration with major sporting organisations who can use our data to improve participation and growth of their sports in and outside school. As this program is universal and accessible to every child, we are able to reach those 27% of pupils who are overweight or obese and also engage those 66% of kids who are not affiliated to any sporting organisation. It is open to all pupils irrespective of gender, creed, economic postcode and ethnicity. Our programme empowers young people to take the lead in forming healthy habits at home through interaction with their virtual body, thus improving their quality of life during and after these most difficult times, while maintaining a safe connect with their school. This is a one-stop holistic digital health P1-7 programme 
that is now ready to be placed in every primary school in Northern Ireland with your support. We have just included some testimonials from a principal, a teacher, and most recently a parent. Um, so that's it's pretty hard for us to condense into 10 minutes everything that's been going on, but that hopefully gives you an overview of the Healthy Kids program to date. Um, and I'm sure you will have plenty of questions or we would certainly welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for that presentation. Um, you, you did extremely well to get it into 10 minutes. Um, I, we are short on time this morning, so I will try and be brief and, and get members in for questions. But um, it, it, it appears to be an extremely innovative use of AI and, and ed tech in response to, um, if you heard our last session, what appears to be a fairly significant challenge in terms of physical activity and access to physical activity and access to physical education for children and young people pre-COVID, um, which will only have been exacerbated during COVID. What, Kevin, my brief question for me, what, what is the level of, of, of access to healthy kids at this moment in time or, or the, the level of use of healthy kids at this moment in time? Um, yeah, it started off in, in, in my school, um, Chris, as I say, back in 2014, and it just incrementally has grown through that um, through that period. As I said, at the start, we're into 150 schools at the minute. We're probably reaching out to about 12,000 kids per week. And, and how, how is Healthy Kids procured? Is it procured individually by the schools? Well, we did receive funding um, from Stormont back in 2015, actually six months just before it, um, it, the government collapsed. Oh, yeah, so it was, um, and then we had to go back to the schools then and say, look, the funding essentially was cut, but schools had, were saying, look, this is such a good program, it's so important to the development of what's needed, and they then paid for it themselves through various means and mechanisms. And even most recently, there the health and wellbeing money that was issued by the Department um, of Education, schools immediately were coming to us and saying, look, can we use this for your programme? Excellent programme. Um, I'm a youth uh, sport coach, so you can even see ways of integrating training loads um, as, as well. For um, so I, I realise you want to target um, pupils um, who uh, uh, holistically in terms of um, physical activity, but so on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes there's children perhaps who need to manage that physical activity as well. So yeah, fascinating. Um, I better stop and allow other members in. Uh, Deputy Chairperson Pat uh, Shane, MLA. Pat, Pat there. Uh, okay, uh, members, we're, we're, we're going to need to limit our, our question to one question and one answer, but th uh, thanks very much indeed, Pat. Thanks, Chair. A bit of a technical difficulty there. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation, lad. I think I heard you, Kevin, must have been back to 2014 or 2015. So uh, I want to commend you on uh, how far the project has come and the great work that you're doing. And I suppose it's striking, given all the presentations we've heard today and previously, um, you know, the number of programmes that are being delivered in schools, and many have the same objectives and, and outcomes. And I have been arguing now in the context of the pandemic and the crisis we're going to face, uh, our children are going to face uh, when schools return again, that there should be some sort of coherent coordinated, integrated strategy to deal with not just lost learning, but to prioritise emotional and psychological well-being uh, among our children. Uh, so I'm wondering, given your own experiences uh, uh, within your own programme, is there anything in particular you'd like to see in that strategy? I think, yes, sorry, Brandon, you go ahead, yep. Um, yeah, so just fully agree that, that really when you're looking at the holistic health of a child, really you can't separate out the physical and emotional well-being. And that was a, um, a very quick thing we learned then as we rolled the program out across schools and more and more 
principals were coming in um, and asking just for that emotional well-being content. So suppose we don't really know what, what's coming down the line for our, um, our, our, our children and young people um, post-COVID. The King's Fund paper that I, that I did mention talked about you know, 75, this isn't in the adult population, but we can extrapolate to some extent, 75% of, of the population experiencing some temporary low-level degree of stress, 15 to 20% going on to, to experience some actual stress, anxiety, and sleep deprivation, and 2 to 3% needing um, some, some formal care. And it's really healthy kids and, and the work we've been putting together um, is, is occupying that lower tier there of um, to be to offer holistic trauma informed and um, support for for um, everyone. So there's a, a, some real key things are around um, resilience um, and about social um, interaction and relationships and those things that, are, that have maybe been damaged and um, with all, all the um, social isolation that the kids have been um, experiencing. Yeah, I would just like to, I would just like to add to that part that it, it has to be it has to sit within a within a bigger picture it has to sit within a bigger frame you know the the idea of just getting experts in what bit by bit to deliver it if it was put into a joined up approach as you alluded to and it sits within one dashboard or one feature which can be added to in many facets of you know this dashboard can be added to with other things i think it's important that it sits within the bigger picture yeah uh, thanks thanks and uh, um, I just want again to, to commend you on the great work that you're doing. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for coming to present here this morning. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pat. And apologies, members, that I have to truncate this slightly, but uh, yeah, we're, we're we're looking at about four four minutes per member. One one question, one answer, roughly. So th thanks for that important question, Pat. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA? Thanks, Chair. I really thank you for that, Chair. I'll be very brief. Uh, excellent presentation, guys. Genuinely love it when, when people bring uh, not problems but solutions, and not only that, bring uh, an authenticity. So uh, I believe that you've been going since 2014. Um, and the, so what, what I'm really interested in, Brent, and this might lean towards you slightly, so I'm really excited to see the, the, the potential for further development of technology and, and uh, uh, IT to possibly even bring this even further and make it even more individualized. So with regard to the link between uh, outdoor activities and um, uh, mental health and emotional well-being and that type of stuff, what benefits do you really see with the, um, the, the development of the app and that personalized approach? And also, just finally, have you considered uh, VR, virtual reality, and maybe speaking to future screens, AI, who are absolutely really, really, really good in terms of offering out conversations with guys like yourself to develop things even further because we really need to get on top of this guys and uh, certainly from what i've heard today really interested in what you guys are doing thank you sir so i can speak a little bit about that and that and um, healthy kids i suppose pre-covid were very firmly in that digital space and and you know innovation being one of our key kind of um, values and, and objectives so whenever um covid came along i suppose we were able to flex very quickly to meet those those um, emergent demands the emotional well-being content is one of the newer components of the, of the program um, and it's been piloted with P P sevens, and where we are, we have secured more funding to develop a, a, a program that reaches from P one right through to P seven, and really to make sure we are um, standardising the delivery of that. There's a real opportunity for us to digitise the, the the content, so it's not being left to um, teachers to understand how to how to explain and, and discuss these these complex emotional um, challenges. So we are we're absolutely looking at how to embed that within the teacher dashboard for that sort of digital offering. And no, we, we, I don't believe, and maybe some of the other guys can, can comment, but we don't think we have looked at um, VR, but um, as, as a very sort of um, forward-looking company, that's something that really would, would excite us. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks for that. Um, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Kevin, Chris, Paul, and Brandon for what really is, uh, and I had a bit of knowledge of, uh, of the program, but certainly um, it is an exciting uh, program, uh, a good investment uh, in, in our children. Uh, I have to say, I do like, I have all, always liked the idea that you, 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 look, you look at the children's bodies and teach them hard to, or instruct them hard to, encourage them in their own emotional well-being and indeed healthy habits uh, 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 at home. And, that's all good, well-rounded stuff. Just two very quick questions, Chair. Um, is this ever used in addition 
or, or in substitution of uh, uh, PE? And, and indeed, is there a potential of what you're doing to be developed to take it up to a second level education stage? Yeah, I, I can take that if that's okay, sir. Sure. Um, Robin, thank you for your question. Um, so first, first of all, this certainly enhances and, and can play the primary role in delivering PE in a school. The, the intention behind this is is to you know enhance the skill set of teachers first and foremost. I know that was that's been spoken about at length today. And um, so so it's certainly there to try and give teachers ideas and, and, and certain confidence to try and deliver sessions. Um, the plethora and the, the, the amount of resources available mean that this covers the entire curriculum for all ages. So it's, 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 it can be set really at the centerpiece of any school's uh, PE program. Um, in addition to what you're talking about with um, secondary schools, absolutely. The way that this digital uh, piece has been loosely built, as Kevin mentioned, this can be added to and, and greatly enhanced. We have run a number of, of uh, pilots in secondary schools based around healthy teens. And um, even just recently there, we've secured a, a really sort of high-end pilot where we're going to add wearable devices to, uh, to a select number of, of students. And as I say, we're going to feed that data through. And it's all based around encouraging those young people um, to pursue a healthy lifestyle. So as I say, yes, absolutely, this can go um, and be progressed into the secondary school sector. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm content with that. Thanks, thanks, Robin. Thanks for those uh, answers, folks, as well. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks, Chair. Um, Kevin, Paul, Chris, Brandon, for your very, very professional presentation this morning. Um, and all I can think, I'm thinking, this, we were listening to it and watching it, I'm thinking groundbreaking, I'm thinking innovative, I'm thinking inspiring, I'm thinking exciting. My God, guys, it's unbelievable what you're doing. It's unbelievable what you're doing. It's so, so important the work you're doing, especially in the context of the presentations we heard in advance. We're really concerned about the lack of exercise that the kids are getting access to in schools and what you're you're doing and making it so much easier, so much more um, mainstream. It's it's fantastic. And just a little anecdotal uh, feedback is a parent from Graham Moore School in Armagh. His little daughter, Annie, does the 30-minute class, and she just loves it. And that's in, ter in terms of the context of getting more girls involved in sports and, and physical activity. That's absolutely inspiring, absolutely brilliant. So well done, well done getting to where you've got to. Well done for weathering the storm of the executive being down and losing that funding stream and keeping going. So you've demonstrated the resilience of your company, of your organization, of your, of your mission already. So that is phenomenal. Keep going. In terms of your last slide, your last slide you talked about the partnerships with universities. You give me a little more information on that and also give me more details on the the metrics that you're gathering and how what are the three mechanisms of gathering metrics from from the children guys please thank you justin thank you for that positive feedback as well much appreciated um yeah on terms of the universities um we are working with the university of ulster as chris has alluded to through the chic program to develop the, the, the digital and data processing um of it because we want to have credible data for our stakeholders that we can show that it works first and foremost. We're working with Stromellis at the minute university to develop an early years intervention program. We've consulted with primary one, primary two nursery teachers, and they're saying that, you know, we need to put, we need the teachers are saying, we need to be looking at children's whole development, reading stories at night, you know, doing home learning, any activity, can we, can we get that recorded as well? Sumeria's college, Sumeria's teacher training college in Belfast, as well, we're working with their PE department now, and they're going to provide PE students for us to develop video lessons for, for teachers. So essentially, te young teachers creating videos for teachers, and then that will be put on the dashboard. So we're trying to empower, to re-empower teachers in this area, because teachers do need re-empowered. They do need to uh, upskill their, their, their upskill, be upskilled, and also develop their confidence and be able to deliver this. And doing it through a, a dashboard is an easier way to do this. And lastly, as Paul said, then Queen's University, Justin, working on the food safe program to add into the, the nutritional um, the nutritional side. So the, all the major universities we're, we're now working with. Um, well, one quick question, Kevin, before you know, the chair was you on, we're out of time. Benchmarking. Have you benchmarked internationally in terms of what's going on across the world, in terms of what you're doing? Yeah, well, in terms of, in terms of you were saying about um, looking at what we do qualitatively, um, the, the, I suppose the growth on the schools Penford would be one way, but quantitatively, Chris, do you want to take a, a, a stab at that, the quantitative one? 
Yeah, absolutely. So pretty much from our from our inception in 2015, 2014, um, we very much had that idea of, you know, how do, how do we know that this, uh, how this program actually has an effect on children? What, what can we actually measure uh, quantitatively to be able to show the impact of the program it has? So throughout those different years, we've, we've um, used different sort of test methods in terms of different f- uh, components of fitness. Um, there was a recent paper in 2018 that was published uh, that covered that showed a uh, that showed normative data for a uh, across european um, children and across international children as well throughout the, throughout the world so we have then used those metrics as our as our key a uh, our, our key metrics for for measuring children's fitness and their physical activity levels so throughout those years the the pe program if you compare our, our results to kids that or skills that take part in the Healthy Kids program, in comparison to skills that don't take part in the Healthy Kids program, you'll see that there's 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 significant difference between those different skills, and that, that's verified by um, yeah, Dr. Aileen Johnson from QUB to actually you know perform those uh, you actually perform that analysis. So we we have those metrics in place, um, and we're we actually have based on the data we collected, we ha- we can now establish normative data for Northern Ireland as well for um, nine to eleven year olds, where we can ex- actually establish say and um, compare current uh, current pupils to those to those n- new norms and across the international norms as well. Unbelievable, guys! Keep going. Thank you, thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, I, 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 that question has just made me think. Justin, we we measure our our, our children and young people um, within an inch on all the academic subjects and do very little in terms of physical education um, outside of of what what you've just um, set out yourselves through your own work. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm ignorant. But that, that would be my impression so that, that's really interesting um i, I want to know how to download the app and get access to it for my kids <laughs> get them get them get their fitness challenges going here as soon as they get them home um, um okay thanks for that justin thanks for those answers um i'll bring in william humphrey mla that's william there Chat. Sorry, Chair. Possible uh, William had the head on. Yeah, no problem. Uh, can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. And again, th- thanks everybody for your presentation today. It was brilliant. And I'd just like to um, reiterate what the rest of the members have said and congratulate you on the great work you've done. It's really nice to actually hear a positive story. So thanks for that there. Um, I have one quick question. Professor Siobhan O'Neill was on the committee with us um, a few weeks back and she touched on one point she made was about um, the importance of children's physical health, so including their nutrition and activity and the impact this then has on their emotional well-being. I noticed from your presentation you talked about net or nutrition eyes and teeth. Can you give me a wee bit more um, information about that there and how that has impacted children's mental health? Um, yeah, I can take that, Nicola, if that's okay. Um, so I went through that slide and um, the NET programme, as you said, Nutrition, Eyes, Ears and Teeth, we're very much taking the steer from Queen's on this one and um, their Centre for Public Health. They have run pilots um, based around this project there. Uh, I know that it ran in 18 schools and it was seen to have a hugely positive impact. Um, so this is something that we're going to add onto our dashboard that will increase access, that will increase the reach of it um, so that more and more schools then can, uh, can benefit from it. Um, so absolutely, it's going to be, as I, as I sort of mentioned in the slide, the means of delivery will be live delivery from professionals, obviously, uh, recorded video, follow-up worksheets, and again, of course, this upskilling of teachers, empowering the teachers to deliver lessons and lesson plans as well. So that's very much how that works around uh, around this general health aspect in terms of net. And focusing on nutrition for children and how that will benefit them, like their overall health, yeah? Absolutely. So it, it doesn't just concentrate on the nutrition itself. And of course, you know, getting into to what you're putting into your body, but it's actually where it comes from as well. And um, there's been a few key stakeholders there. Some of the big companies, the Moy Parks, etc., um, are throwing their weight behind this as well. So it could really make a huge impact. But absolutely, it's addressing those nutritional um, questions that are being asked in schools and, and, and by parents um, for the benefit of their, of their children. 
brilliant um i think that's really excellent actually just one other point i want to make i really enjoyed the end um part of the presentation um i think it was kevin you had said about the engagement with all the stakeholders obviously that's so important and it kind of just shows how successful your campaign has been because of that there so well done on that as well thank you and thank you chair thanks nicola and uh, thanks for all those question members um yeah I, I, I'm superb program uh, folks um, what are what are your your plans for upscaling what in what way can um, public bodies partner with you are, are there any particular asks of the executive or the Department of Education at this stage yeah well the, the, we have a digital license cost um, Chris, that, that's, that's going to be a cost to go into the schools and the ask would be that we get supported, you know, the Department of Education in this. Um, now, this we, what we don't want is this to go on the teacher's dashboard and then it sits on the shelf and gathers dust. You know, that's just a really futile exercise. So to make it, to make it um, really important, we are also looking to establish health and wellbeing officers for each council area. And those health and wellbeing officers would be responsible for upscaling the teachers, training the teachers up on their use of the dashboard, and then more importantly, monitoring that progress and making sure, you know, we want to know if schools aren't using it, why they're not using it, why are they not get, gathering data? Because the data that we get, we want to be able to say that Northern Ireland are now leading the way with 60, we can say, for example, X percent of children in Northern Ireland are achieving their 60 minutes of activity a day, and through wearable device, teacher dashboard, children's app, we've got the facility to do that. So, you know, that's the, 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 the digital license is one cost and then the full implementation will be another cost, but we'll be happy to discuss that at a later later date. Yeah. It might be our our formal committee sessions are obviously limited in timings, but we would endeavour to do informal meetings. Um and one action um flowing from the last session was to get a an informal um run through of the PE curriculum. It'd be great if you were available to maybe give members a, an informal meeting run through of of healthy kids and in, in, in a bit more detail um and, and for us to understand how we can help you to to uh to, to roll this out further and um and, and you know and increase the 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 impact that it's it's able to have my mind my mind's running away in terms of what it would do in sports clubs as well as schools to be honest with you um but um uh, thanks so much for your your time today it, it would be great to maintain that that contact with you and make sure we do all we can to, to support your work i hope i hope it's been a, a useful experience for you to to present to the committee today as well thank you thank you so much okay members then that that concludes that agenda item um and can i ask the clerk uh, to summarize any actions Yes, Chair, I mean, simply to get, to arrange an, an informal meeting um, with Healthy Kids um, where members can have a run through of the app um, and put the committee in a better position then to promote uh, what are excellent tools. Mem members content with that suggestion? I, th I think that's the tip of the iceberg there today in terms of the, the scope of, 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 of that innovation. Um, anyone want to come in at that point? Sure, can I, can I suggest, in you know, context of celebrating the positive as well, can we write to Healthy Kids and congratulate them on their renovation, on their, their enterprise, and on their really important work, and their, their mission to uh, help uh, young people be healthier and more, more resilient and stronger. And I think it's a very, very um, worthy and, and uh, special mission that they have. We'd, we'd be glad to, to do that with if members if we write to Healthy Kids to and commend them and recognise uh, that work and, and seek to set up a, an informal briefing for members that would be available to understand it in a, a bit more detail. I, I suppose COVID has, has, has forced us all to consider the, the scope and the benefit of, of technology um, for responding to public problems, public challenges, and, and these guys were ahead of ahead of the game in that regard so if you were if you were using technology in an innovative way pre-covid then your your solution has just took on tenfold relevance really hasn't it you know um and, and their their time is now um so yeah that would, that would be great uh, any other members want to come in before i go to correspondence and and conclude our business for today 
No, nope, happy enough. Okay, Clark, if you're happy to write the healthy kids on those grounds, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, and in the correspondence, then, members, um, it starts at page 281, where we have seven items, and then there's a summary note at page 282. Um, item 8.3 on page 287 is correspondence about concerns um, refunding for grant maintained integrated schools by the Education Authority. Um, members, are you content to write and forward that to the Education Authority um, in respect of those concerns? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Um, item 8.4 on page 308 is a response from the Department regarding steps being taken to plan for the post-primary curriculum in 2021 to 2022 to address learning um, lost this year. Um, are you content to write and forward that response to the individual who raised the matter with the committee? <coughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, item 87 on page 304 is a response from the Minister on the decision to disallow uh, the WJEC qualifications. The Minister has indicated that he believes there are sufficient alternative awarding organisations offering the same or similar specifications and that all of the specifications currently offered by WJEC are also offered by other awarding organisations, including by WJEC under the EDUCAST banner, which are regulated by Ofqual and remain available to schools in Northern Ireland. The Minister also indicates that officials will continue to engage with colleagues in Wales to seek greater clarity on the direction of travel and timing of any potential changes to qualifications in Wales, in light of the recommendations in the recent report on the independent review of alternative awarding arrangements in Wales in 2020. Um, and the Minister further notes, um, as he said to the committee the other day, that should he re receive clarification and assurances that qualifications offered by the Welsh Exam Board will remain compatible with curriculum policy in Northern Ireland, he would be willing to revisit his decision in relation to the WJEC qualifications. Um, Members, I, I propose that you might forward um, that the response to those who wrote to the committee on this matter. Um, perhaps you have additional views on this letter. Yeah, uh, Pat, do you want to come in there? Yes, Chair. Uh, just in the Minister's assertion that uh, there are other courses already available to replace the WKAC course. I'm not sure that the accurate question is the people who wrote to me uh, about this, that, that none of the other exam boards cover some of the courses that the WJEC do. So I wonder, could we get clarity around that issue from whoever? Yeah, I, I, that's a fair point, Pat. I think um, the, the a primary concern of people that had corresponded with us was, in fact, that... Um, the specifications of some of those WJC qualifications were not available um, elsewhere. So if, if I would be content for us to respond to the minister to um, to dispute that and to ask him to um, step out the alternative options that he says are the same or similar uh, for the courses that are being sat um, by pupils in Northern Ireland and WJC at this time. Does that sound fair enough, Pat? Yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and then obviously in our responding to people that have written to us, we can ask them for their views, particular in relation to the Minister's assertion that the, um, the Awards are available in same or similar specification elsewhere. I, I think you'll find disagreement with that, as you say. Pat, Justin, you want to come in there as well? Just, just quickly, I agree with what Pat said. And, um, probably the lack of consultation in advance of making that decision, which was disturbing, and the, the distress that's caused and is causing amongst the uh, principals, school staff, and pupils. And some pupil cohorts actually feel discriminated against because of this decision out of the blue, and that's something needs to be addressed in that correspondence as well. Because is there a cohort of pupils who are actually being discriminated against? There's no context of this decision. Yeah, I, I'm also concerned, members, with the, the final comments there, where the minister says that should he receive clarification 
uh, the qualifications offered by the Welsh exam boards will remain compatible with curriculum policy in Northern Ireland, I would be willing to revisit my decision in relation to WJC qualifications. Is, is this part of some strange negotiation process, um, you know, for which learners in Northern Ireland that have used WJC qualifications are seemingly collateral damage at this stage? Um, I, 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 it's hard not to conclude otherwise, but um, I think if we invite the Minister to ask um, where the same or similar specifications for those courses that learners and teachers are so concerned about losing are, are available elsewhere, um, and if we, in our response to people that are curious about this, ask them if they agree with the Minister's assertion. Um, however, um, I, we're starting to run out of who's available to us to challenge this to a certain extent. Maybe we'd want to consider an education committee motion in relation to this to, to ask for other questions. But, but um, I think we're, we're almost exhausted our, our challenge function on the minister in relation to this particular matter. But if members are content to um, to send the correspondence as agreed, I think that's a fair enough next step at this stage. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Um, okay, so item 8, 8 on page 308 is a response from the Education Authority uh, indicating that it's preparing a procurement needs request, outlining a business case for parental engagement software for schools, and expects bids from software providers, including Seesaw. Um, so are members content to note that and forward to Goliath and Blended NI? Yeah, members, so th this is in response to... Uh, our evidence session with Blended and I and Goliath um, when we were notified about uh, uh, a, a business case for the uh, for a tender for the extension of parental engagement or, or, or digital learning platforms to more schools or primary schools in particular in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the update is advising us that it's hoped that the tender process will be completed ahead of or by the 31st of March 2021. Um, would, would members agree that it's appropriate to write back to ask why it, it took so long, given that the, the key time for, the, for access to digital learning apps were, were during remote learning? And the, by the 31st of March, one would hope that there will be a, a significant reduction in remote learning. So remember, we can be we return our comments to ask why it took or will take until the 31st of March. Great. Is yep. that a what you were saying there, Chris? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we're losing on it there. I'll try, I'll try again, Justin. Members can to ask why it has taken to the 31st of March. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting nods. Okay. Thanks, Clark. For the other correspondence, then, are members content to dispose of it um, as per the summary note at page 282? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Members, agenda item nine is forward work program. Members content with the Ford Work Program uh, at this stage? Content. Yeah. Um, members, I would propose that we suggest an invitation to the, the Minister with regards to school restart on the 10th of March. Would members be content to agree that? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Sure. Yes. So can we agree that that's also a vaccination? In schools, in special schools and in the mainstream schools, there needs to be some sort of agreement in terms of what, what the protocol is going to be going forward. Well, that's, the uncertainty is going to become more prevalent in the coming weeks, and that needs dealt with uh, affirmatively by the Minister and the Health Minister uh, very soon. Um, also, the UNESCO study that's being reported on today, um, which is not really painting education here in a very positive light. Okay, do you want to write to the Minister with regards to an update on um, education staff vaccinations? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and his response to the UNESCO report published today? Yeah. And okay. also in relation to worrying uh, reports about children doing their homeschooling via their mobile phone. Uh, 
mm. at this this stage of a pandemic? Can we get some urgent responses on that issue and how it's being addressed and dealt with? An update on, on digital device access, yep. That's all okay. for now, sure. Okay. okay. Okay, members. Uh, members content to move agenda item 10. Any other business? Okay, then our next meeting is Wednesday, the 24th of February via Starlink at 9.30 a.m. The committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.